are now tuned into streaming on YouTube, Facebook, and on Periscope. Larry Reed Live. Tell your family and tell your friends that we are on and we have an update on tonight. I don't know what's going on. I'm only supposed to be coming on Mondays at 7 p.m. But it's like June and July, things been popping up and happening behind the scenes and I'm having to quickly, in a hurry, get to the studio space, set things up so that I can bring to you something that has went viral. Listen, I don't know if y'all saw yesterday's show, but we talked about Omarosa. Have y'all seen what is happening with the Trump administration see I really need to do that show right now but I received a phone call my lines have been blowing up and my email box I had to work my other jobs today and I was working those jobs and I kept getting all this bang 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 zing zing because hello read what's it I mean this thing the thing my office line has been blowing up 844 dr read 2 has been lit and Larry live at gmail.com lit all the way up people were so moved at the end of the show yesterday I done a recap and an update concerning a story we did about Mm, a week ago originally. So tonight, for the first five, ten minutes of the show, I'm going to catch you up if you do not know about this story. And then we are going to get an exclusive interview with Lady Paula Scarlett Brown. This is the only interview that she will do and she's doing it with Larry Reed live on tonight. She is already ready to call in and allow me to interview her so you can hear from the horse's mouth what has transpired. I'm gonna tell you, when I first heard about this story, my, I, my nerves just went all, all sorts of places and I just couldn't understand. And so what I had to do for the last few hours, I had to educate myself, research, and mash all the pieces together because there were parts that had to be discovered or uncovered. And so we're going to talk about it tonight. And then after I interview her, I'm going to allow you to call in to tell me what you think. And if you have some questions that you want to know, you can email Larry Reed live at gmail.com and I will get a notification and I will see them and I will ask her those questions. And I already told her that if I ask her a question she doesn't want to answer, she can say, I don't want to answer that question. Okay, so let me catch up. So go ahead and share the link. Now, I know a whole of lot of y'all bishops and pastors and gospel artists, you don't like to be seen watching Larry live, but I know that you watch the show. So in order for you to, you know, watch the show real time and nobody know that you're watching, go over there to YouTube, subscribe. I can't see who subscribed. I just see the numbers go up. In fact, let's celebrate. We, and over the last three weeks, we've increased almost 2,000 subscribers. You know, so go over there to YouTube and just subscribe, hit the bell so you always get notified when I live. And on YouTube, you can watch and nobody can know that you watch. Ain't that something? <coughs> If you're on Facebook and you're scared to be seen, go on over there to YouTube. Won't nobody be able to know, know that you won't nobody be able to know you're watching. You won't have to wait until afterwards. I tell you, the, at, at the end of the show, the Facebook views will just start doubling quick in an area because folk don't want to let me see that y'all watching the show. But I know y'all be watching, so let's go ahead and have this conversation. Let me update you. So let me tell you what happened. I was scrolling through probably about a week and a half ago, and I seen it. Well, let me, let me back up, let me back up. I saw this video that was viral of this sweet lady talking at her husband's funeral. And I'm going to let you see about 16 seconds of what she said that I thought was hilarious. Watch this. I, I, first ladies, please stand. Sorry. First, all oh, first ladies, please stand. Or second ladies or third ladies, because I'm a third lady. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> it's okay. It's the truth. 
Okay, you see, she was the third wife of the founding bishop, Bishop Roy Brown of the Pilgrim Church in Brooklyn, New York, and the founding father of the Pilgrim Assemblies. Now, I may get the wrong, the rows, the um, the words wrong, but you know what I'm talking about. It's the whole network of all of them. Got so the a whole bunch of churches around Brooklyn, this place, here, there, and all of that kind of going on. So here he is, the head honcho. He died first week of June. That was his wife. This is his wife, Lady Paula Scarlett Brown, speaking at her husband's funeral. And the speech that she gave is really long. It's on, online. She gave a, a wonderful speech. She talked to those that were responsible of uh, uh, taking things forward. She spoke really nice and she spoke really, really kind. And so I was just minding my business probably about a week and some change ago. And I seen this letter. I said, everybody, first of all, folk kept sending me this letter. And I kept looking at the notifications coming by, and I seen it was an image, and I seen it was a letter. I said, I get that later on, I get that later on. Then I was tagged in it a few hundred thousand times, and I saw this. And it said, 10 day notice to quit to Paula Scarlett Brown and all other persons occupying or in possession of the premises known as and located at 1721, whatever that is, Avenue, I can't halfway sit in here in this studio. I don't even know what that word is. But it's in Brooklyn, New York, area code, I mean zip code, 11226. And then just went on to basically say, this is Pilgrim Baptist Church property and you need to get up out of this house. And they were talking to her. For 22, 23 years, I do believe, we're going to verify all of this tonight, she was married to the founding father. About 15 of those years, according to my research, we're going to find out tonight, she served her husband those 20-something years, and about 15 of those years, he was sick and she took care of him. This is the man that she was married to. This man is Bishop Roy Brown. A visionary, according to what I've heard and what I research, has done so many things in Brooklyn. In fact, Reverend Al Sharpton calls him the Pentecostal giant in New York. He's also the spiritual father of a very popular preacher that we've seen all over the Word Network. We have seen all, all the time. I mean, He's been talked about so much on the Word Network, on TBN, on BET. Everybody has talked about this man, E. Bernard Jordan. Roy Brown is the spiritual father of Bishop Prophet E. Bernard Jordan. Now, the fellowship of churches that Bishop Roy Brown has is now been turned over to a few years back because Bishop War Brown wasn't doing well, was turned over to Bishop William Hudson. Now, you may not know Bishop William Hudson. You may not think you know, but if you rewind a whole bunch of years, y'all remember that sitcom, Amen? You remember that little preacher that came in there and, and he was a little boy and preacher? Well, that was him. That's the man. Yeah, I met him in the mountains of the prophetic conference many, 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 many years ago. And his musicians or something didn't come on right and didn't do right. So he called me. And then, ain't you got a musician? I said, yeah. And I sit my musician. They got stuff together. That's him. And he's over all of the churches now, all of the network. Now, Pilgrim Baptist Church is now being pastored by a female named Pastor Deborah, hold on for a minute. I'm just going to call her, no, I got her picture down there. It's not down there? Okay. Pastor Crow, that's, a, that's her over there. And she has taken over the church. But let me explain something according to what I understand. 
She took over this ministry many years ago. I think officially eight years ago when he got sick in 2000 and, and well, he was already sick prior to that, but it's got to where he couldn't have way do nothing. And she took over the church. But prior to those eight years, just to make sure so you can understand, this woman was in the decision making, the finance. Now, this is all alleged. We're going to we'll be able to ask up was in the decision-making, the administration, the operation of everything concerning this church. This was the kind of woman, if Bishop said, I need somebody to wash my feet right now. All right, Bishop, I'm coming. I'm coming to wash your feet. I need somebody to bring me a chicken leg, a two-piece from Popeye's. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I know they ain't open, but call the owner and tell the management, go down there, cook me up some chicken to bring me a two-piece of some biscuit, and I need it right now. Deborah Cole was Crow. It was the one that get it's a Deborah Deborah. I don't know. It's the, Pastor Crow was the one to get it done. So she had the trust of Bishop. And I'm gonna say this because I did pastor 20 years and I was the bishop over churches. Whenever you got somebody that has an administrative skill and is resourceful. I don't care if you married, and I can say this because this happened to me. I was married 18 years, but when it came to church stuff and when it came to my vision, I relied on my staff more than I did my wife, which I might well put my business out there. If you ask me, she'll say it was her fault. You know, she'll take her responsibility. I take my responsibility, but on, on my onus, I say that I relied on my staff and relied on my assistants more than I did my wife. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And this is an epidemic and it happens everywhere because sometimes the wife has not made herself a part of the man's vision. This happens in corporate America. Men fall in love with their work and they fall in love with their vision. And a smart woman will put herself in a position to where she is intertwined and interwoven with what he is really in love with. And that is his job. If you believe the Bible and you believe in the beginning, man was given work before he was given a wife. So it just happens. Got it? So she was the woman that was a part. Where's she over there? She over there. Not this near. Over there. She was a part of his vision and of his work and had his trust. And because she had that, she had his power. And because she had that, she had the authority and still do to make whatever decision she wants to make. Now, are the decisions that she's making, are they ethical? Is it with Lady Paula Scarlett Brown in mind? Is it with the wishes of Bishop Ward Brown in mind? Because quiet as it's kept, it was told unto me and put a punch my lip, my, my ears. And now it sits upon my lips and I tell you this. It was said to me that his wishes was that the house go to Paula. And that the house, the 2.5 million, that's the tax value, but actually it's about 3.5 million house was supposed to go to her. But during the course of his sickness, and they say he was a little bit senile, we'll find out from the wife, that some decisions, either he unmade them or they were unmade for him, which put her in a space to where she was not taken care of. So we had this particular show, we talked about it, and everybody called in, about 10,000 you, of, of you have already watched that video and the numbers are still going up. And you said that Bishop Ward Brown was at fault. And he may be. We're going to be able to talk to her. We're going to be able to ask her some questions. But then we saw this video from his only daughter, Tawana. Watch this. Stop. My father was an excellent provider. I say it again. Excellent. I'm the only one that wasn't given what was left to her. And I'm not on here angry or having no cause. Thank you, Lakeisha. I know you do. I believe that, sis. I mean that. 
So know what you're talking about when you come on live, when you make posts. Know what you're talking about. No. No. Do y'all really think my father would not provide? Stop it. Stop it. Think before you open your mouths. Just because provision wasn't made the way you feel it should be made doesn't mean provision wasn't made. Now, according to what Tawana said, she said my daddy was an awesome provider. And I watched the whole video. And she said I had to share him with all of the world. And my daddy provided for his wife of 22 years. He may not have provided the way y'all think that she should have been provided for, meaning that she able to stay up in that crib. But she was provided for. Well, quiet as it's kept, it was spoke into my ears, not coming out my lips. It was said that the church got whole. Listen, listen to what church did. We're going to find out tonight got hold of a $100,000 insurance policy that the church got and made her the beneficiary of $100,000. That's what was said. So we done a recap. Was it last night? Yeah. Done a recap last night. And we talked about that. We said, okay, she get $100,000, but that ain't enough. And of course, Tawana made sure she put in there that she got $100,000 and ain't got nothing. So I say, I ain't got nothing. They ain't give me nothing. Now, that's what she said. I don't know if she realized she really put her daddy on blast. Because I one side of your mouth, you said that he was great, took care of, and the other side of your mouth is saying he didn't give me nothing. So if he ain't going to give his daughter nothing, and, and, I wanna, and I want you guys to please understand this. I know this may be Bishop Roy Brown and even Pastor Deborah may be your golden calf. Meaning, oh, don't you say nothing about my bishop, my pastor. I get that. I, I, I understand that mentality that makes sense, like talking about somebody's mama. But Tom, if there has been some negligence or something that Bishop War Brown did not do, what do we do then? We look to Deborah. Deborah, what what, what you going to do about, about this? Because Bishop ain't take care of this, and you got the power to make some changes. You could sell that house and then and take the profits from that house and, and get the board to agree at the church and give the money to her so she can go on by the life and live the equivalent of the kind of life she's been living for 20-something years. Or if Deborah don't do something, put William up there. We can call way over there. I don't know why he over the churches and he wake up. Most of the churches is over there in New York. Why? Call over there and say, Bishop William Hudson, that used to be on Amen as a little bishop, a little preacher. Um, do you have, first of all, do you have any authority to make any kind of sale or transaction that can benefit Paula? Because now you over the churches and you and, and Deborah got to do something because then we're going to be looking at y'all strange if y'all let this widow end up on the street. And then they don't do something. The next person I'm going to call, I'm going to say, Bishop Bernard Jordan. Now, we know how much money you got. Because you've been prophesying since Jesus was a baby, since little Richard was a little gal. You've been prophesying for a long time. And them folk from Africa and them big kings and stuff, they type. I remember one time somebody said they was on your line and somebody sitting there typed to you for a million dollars. You got all kinds of money, all kinds of money. Russell Simmons, them, do they type to you? And that boy, what's the other boy, uh, uh, the Simmons boy? The, the, uh, is it Russell? And no, his brother, light-skinned preacher, Reverend Ruff, they send you all that money and, um, and they got them shoes. The daughters got the shoes. You get all that type money. You got some money. I'm saying, well, Mr. Jordan, can't you send them some money? Well, let me tell you what I found out. This is a legend. I'm going to ask Paula, though. Come to find out that on Sunday, Bishop, Bishop E. Bernard Jordan stood up and told his church, I'm pulling out the entire fellowship. And the church went up and praised. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You know, his church full of prophets. We know. Who love thank you, Jesus. Because Lord told us too. Mm -hmm. That we leaving the church. We gone. We tired of this church. 
And that's only one part of the church. This part of the church, I think, hold about 1,500 folk or, or less. But then the, on the other side, there's the Renaissance Center. They would have had big events. They would have had a funeral. That holds 4,000. This church got all kind of properties. I think somebody told me 25 property, properties or 30 properties all around Brooklyn. Just money. Bring that back over. I'm going to tell you, you say what you want to say about Bishop E. Bernard Jordan. But this man here is a show enough prophet, a show enough. Whether he a prophet of God or not, you can make that decision. But this here is a prophet. He be right. And if and he's integral and he's led by principles. Now that I know. So if Bishop Bernard Jordan poured out of this fellowship, He's not in agreement. <laughs> he is not in agreement with something. So there's a dead fish and a smell something. something. The prophet don't smell something because he gone. So bring all three of them back over. So now with him gone, the question now for me is back with Deborah. Crow. That's a coincidence she has that name. Crow. You know what Crow do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know her, but I'm just saying. Hmm. So it's time for us to talk to Lady Paula Scarlett Brown. So after this commercial, she's already on the line. After this commercial, during this commercial, you take this link and you share and you hashtag Larry Reed Live. And let's hear from the horse's mouth. They hate to speculate about that paper. I feature burn them eyes, make that fire move on higher. I feature green fame to the name, make them change it. I feature while they hate and speculate, anticipate this. I feature while they hate and speculate about that paper. I feature burn them eyes, make that fire move on higher. I Green fame to the name, make them change it. I feature while they hate and speculate, anticipate it. Everybody dance around loud, that you can't stop hard, put your feet on the floor. Ain't nobody fly like you live in the Well, it's time, it's time for, mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Ooh, Lord, let's pray. The Father, Lord Jesus, name, Lord God, Jesus, name, universe, y'all. Help me today. Help me ask the right question and, and let her feel comfortable with me and know that I'm not going to say anything to her to hurt her feelings. I just want to know. Let her heart be open and let our ears hear. Let us hear, God. Amen. Now, I just taught y'all something. When you want to get your prayer up there to God, you got to sound like the bishop's. Not the apostles, you know, because they're lower than the bishops. You know, that's what they y'all be saying. But you know that ain't right. Not like the apostles and prophets in here, but like the bishops. You got to say, amen. If you don't say that at the end of your prayer, your prayer is not going to be heard. The ain't, they ain't no, it, ain't, it ain't powerful enough unless you say, amen. You got you got prayer. Do you not say, amen. amen. You got to say, Jesus, blam. That prayer ain't went nowhere. You got to say, amen. Amen. No, it's amen, but you got to put your chest into it and use a little bit of your ball set. Amen. 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 
<laughs> All right. Are y'all ready? Are you ready? Patch you in. Beautiful lady Paula Scarlett Brown. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Reed. Hi, how are you? I'm I'm okay, thanks. How are you? Well, I am so elated to have you with me on this live call. And what I want to say to you is, first off, I want to start the interview off by saying this. We have watched what has happened in the news, the social media world, and there are a lot of us, like myself, who, whose heart goes out to you and to your nieces and to everyone that is connected with you that you're leaning on as a support in this hour. And we want to say we are praying for you. And by the end of the show tonight, we're going to that um, GoFundMe link and we're going to help you out. Are you hearing that? Thank you. All Thank right. you. Yeah, I'm, I'm praying for all of us right now. <laughs> okay. Now I have a few. I have a few questions. So I, I first want to know how did you and Bishop Brown meet? I was a member of the church already for around five years, and one Sunday morning he said the Lord said there were two people that sold real estate. You're in here to stand up. I was hesitant to stand because my primary job is an educator. That was my part-time job. But um, he kept saying, you're in here, you're in here. So once I stood up, he said, one of you is going to find the house that I'm looking for. So I knew he was a man of great vision and opulence. And I said, okay. And I took my time to research the house. And approximately a year later, Memor uh, Memorial Day, 1996, May, I thought I found the house that he would like. And I called the church, and we went to see the house. And during the viewing of the house, he was like, I've seen enough. And I was like, oh, my God, he doesn't like the house. And then he's like, we have to go outside. And we go outside, and I go, I'm so sorry. I thought I found something that you would like or the, the Lord would find pleasing to you. And he goes, no, let me tell you something. The Lord said you're going to be my wife. So, of course, I was, like, shocked. And I was like, don't patronize me. That's not how I do business. Business is business. I don't know you like that. And if you don't like the house, it's fine. I'll find you another one. And he was like, no, you're going to be my wife one day. So I didn't think anything of it. And then some months later, just as he prophesied, we ended up being married November of that same year. Wow, that was pretty quick. Now, let me ask you this. Were you in love with Bishop War Brown? Well, as a member of his church, I loved his ministry. I loved his preaching. He was a, a mighty man of valor, anointed man. Every time he went to service, it was never the same. But I wasn't sitting there thinking of him as my husband. I just went to church, <laughs> and I left, and I went to work. Right. That was it. I had no thought. Just like the day he asked me, I wasn't. I was kind of shocked because mm -hmm. I don't know him as the man part. I just know right. him as the preacher part. And um, he's also 20 years my senior, so mm. I, I, I didn't think it was such a fantastic thing, but when I shared it with my, my aunt who used to go to the church, she went to speaking in tongues and praising God. Wow. So, wow. Okay, um, so let me ask you this. How long were you married to Bishop Brown? Uh, this year would have been 23 years. November would have been 23 years. Wow. Now... Being the first lady of the church, what was your role and your duty there in the mm. church? Um, during, during the time when we were getting to know each other, because he said uh, after he asked the marriage part and we had to go out some months later, he said, you need to know me as a man. He said, what I would like is a wife. I'm not interested in a career woman. I'm not interested in a preacher. I'm the preacher of the house. And... When I marry, I want a wife. And mm. he asked me, what did the Bible say about wives? So since I'd been there for years, he's always taught the women, you know, wives obey your husband as unto the Lord. Um, you honor him. You reverence him. So, of course, I gave him all of the biblical teachings he had taught me from the audience. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, so if you marry, are you going to do those things? I said, of course. You've got to do things God's way. You're not going to do it your way. So I knew going in, he just wanted a wife. He said, I want someone to be beside me, someone to travel with me, 
and be a part of my life, but not necessarily a part of the church activities as far as taking a role in the church. So did that require you or did you decide to let go of your career? Because as far as what I know, and, and this is all the information I receive, I always call it alleged until it's verified. You sure. were you were a principal and an educator, and did did you let that go for the sake of being a wife? At the time that at the time that we were dating, I was a staff developer at a school for the Board of Ed, and I had to tell my principal that my husband said the Lord said I have to leave the job, and she was quite upset. Wow. She was quite. Upset. I was a testing coordinator and staff developer. I was upset because I told my husband, "Are you sure?" Uh, my husband to be, I said, you sure this is what God is saying? And he's like, yeah, the Lord said, if you believe me to be the man of God, the same way for everything else, certainly for this, if I tell you the Lord said, then that's what God means. And it was very hard because I loved what I did. I loved the children, my colleagues. I didn't, it was, it was a wonderful environment to be in, to do great things for the community and change children's lives. I mean, you are, very hard. You are to be, you are to be celebrated for, you know, following what you, I'm, Clearly, what you're telling me, you had to believe that. There ain't no way in the world if I was a woman, that would left my career getting paid like that. There ain't no way in the world I would have done that. But you did it. Praise God, Nim. Jesus, Nim, you follow what he said. But let me ask you this here. How long were you? How long were you? I cried. I cried. It was hard. I'm going to cry too. That's a consistent check. You see, church folk check is not consistent. They change their mind. I loved what I did. Not because of the money part. I loved the children and I loved working with children. I I had already been teaching for the 10 years, I believe at that time oh i loved what i was doing i at that point i had passed uh 10 year years i had, was appointed i was secure and we were all working great together so it wasn't about the money it was i didn't honestly they would have to remind me to come and get my check because i'd wow. get so busy at work and let yes me, i needed my money to pay bills but i meant i loved what i did let me ask it was you a this part of who i am as a person You're right let me ask you this as, uh, i'm glad you ended mm-hmm. it like that you said who you are as a person the picture that you are mm-hmm. painting for me it lets me see that i was right i said it up here on this show i said this woman here i can look at her and tell what kind of woman that she is this is a good they don't make women like you no <laughs> no more and and i understand some women probably some of these career women i would never do that i never do what you know but yep you're the kind of wife that my mom was you're the kind of wife that the church mothers i saw you know you were that kind of wife and that <laughs> that that none of those kind of women don't exist anymore no are you west indian <laughs> Well, thank you, but to God be the glory. And all the women in my family are professional nurses, doctors, teachers, lawyers, uh, uh, supervisors. So I didn't even grow up seeing a mother at home. I didn't see that. I didn't know anything about just staying home with the children. And I'm born in Brooklyn, New York, at Brookdale Hospital, 1963. Mm -hmm. I am an American, and I don't know where people are getting the notion that I was a foreigner and I need to go back to where I came from, but that's fine. But uh, my grandfather was Jamaican, my mom was Cuban, and my Got natural it. father was Jewish, and my stepfather is Jamaican. Got it. Okay, so I, so that's where, the, okay, I got it. Okay. Because <laughs> I just felt a West Indian energy with you, but I see that it's in your family line. So I'm going to say this mm-hmm. once, once again. Your, for your service, I don't know if anybody has told you thank you. I don't know Bishop War Brown, but I want to say to you, hats <laughs> off to you. You are to be celebrated. You are to be honored over and over and over and over again for your service and your commitment. Now, I want to ask you a few hard questions. Been married for 22 years. Thank I don't you. know if this is going to be emotional for you, but I want to know at when he was sick, and at the height of you taking care of him, tell us what was your, your days like? What were your daily routine? What were some of the things you experienced as you were taking care of Bishop Ward Brown? Well, when he first became ill, which was a result of the complications of uncontrolled diabetes type 2 and high blood pressure, so his kidneys failed. And he, he, it was even so hard to get him to accept that because uh, the day we ended up in the hospital, both kidneys had failed because he just kept saying he was tired because he knows he's a man of great faith. So then my, after finding out he had to be on dialysis every uh, other day, so it was three days a week for almost four hours on the machine, our lives changed drastically. 
Um, uh, he took the first shift in the morning at 4 a.m. We had to get up at 3, uh, get him. I got him ready. At that time, there was no help for me. I got him ready, got him in the car, drove him to the center, got him inside, we waited for him, talked with him, got him anything he needed while he was on the machine. Um, and then um, by the time he came off, he was so weak, you know, just helping him to the car, helping him get situated, it was it was a lot because I had never seen him like that, and I'm sure mm. he's not someone to complain and be depressed. But I'm sure he had to, his own inner dealings with functioning as now not being the strong man that he was years back. And then we'd get home, and he'd be so weak. So you have to watch him, make sure he's okay, um, get him something to eat. And um, the day it, our days changed because, as you know, he was a Pentecostal preacher. Crusades, revivals, tent services, conventions, and here we are now having to do dialysis and come home and be drained and exhausted, tired, you know, weary, out of it. Um, he used to, eventually he learned how to stabilize with it, but then mm-hmm. the next part, the the leg gave trouble, mm-hmm. and then um, after dealing with the gangrene, he he would he didn't want them to cut his toe. So I would change the dressings every day. I had to watch my husband's foot deteriorate from, you know, being a regular skin to being nothing but layers of dust and flesh falling off. It went from the first toe to the second toe. So I was changing the dressings, and he would wrap his foot up and try to go to church and preach and try to make some events. Some people didn't even notice he would have on one shoe and one slipper. And then, I, and then I'd come home alone with him, get him inside, get him up the stairs, get him in the bed, uh, dress him, change him, you know, whatever he needed, I was there for. And then finally, the leg had gotten so bad, it had to be removed uh, below the knee. So that was the first amputation. So then, then, again, we have to adjust to life now with one leg and how to walk and how to function and then mm-hmm. go to dialysis. And then go in in the house, out of in and out of the wheelchair. So I would put the wheelchair to the door, get put, put get him up the steps. He would lean on me, um, put my leg in between his to push him up the step, like you would do, like a baby that can walk, and get him in the chair. And then wheel him in the house, and then I'd have a wheelchair on another floor. And we had a lift that uh, Pastor Deborah had installed. And so we'd get him in the lift, and then he'd get upstairs, put him in the wheelchair, wheel him to his room, get him out of his room, put him in his bed, undress him. So it was a lot of caring for his everyday needs. Mm. It was it, Life was no longer as it was before. And then as you see, some years after that, then the next leg gave trouble. Mm. And uh, actually he was having stomach pains first, and no one knew what it was. He couldn't sit up. Um, he would be vomiting. The doctors couldn't figure out what it was wrong. Um, he was getting headaches. They couldn't figure out what was wrong. We would go to different specialists. I was with him on all his appointments, um, watching the medications, making sure they were given at the right time. You know, um, preparing the meals. It was. It was doing a lot of what you we would you and I would do on a regular on our own he needed help for he was no longer able to do things on his own so and then did, finally from that go ahead then came the next amputation uh-huh so, so, not, after, not too long after that episode with the stomach aches the vomiting not being able to say, sit up came the next amputation it didn't have gangrene like the other leg it just went cold mm. it just went cold and he was just having a lot of pains in his body just screaming he would be sitting there and just screaming out and, um, of course, you know, having to give those heavy pain meds, oxycotin, mm-hmm. fentanyl, tweaking them to see which one would work right. It was it was very, very stressful, to say the least. And so how, here was this great man. Mm-hmm. And how many years okay. was it like that for you? Oh, oh, from 2005 till he passed. Okay, so you were married 23 years well more than half uh-huh, of those 13 years he yes more than half because it was august 19 2005 we were in, he became completely ill with the kidney failure you mentioned that pastor deborah had a lift installed let me ask you a question how was your relationship with with pastor deborah from then the time you came on to the same your relationship with her as you was a member and then went f- from a member to a wife you know and up to now T- take us you know down memory lane with the relationship uh, that you have with with pastor deborah 
Well, as a member, I we weren't. I didn't know her. I saw her in the church. She would do. She would work sound system. She would work the electrical. She was always moving around the church, but I didn't know her personally, and I was. I didn't know what her role at the church was. But she was always visible. She was always doing something. She was very busy. Um, after we got married, um, I found out that she. Her her exact title was like a right hand person to him. She made everything happen in ministry that he needed to get done. If he wanted um, uh, the chandeliers changed, she got the staff together to change the chandeliers. Hmm. She was there to execute the things that he wanted to see take place. Take place. So what I heard was right. You know, I just had to verify and you know, find out. You know, make sure that I'm getting the right information. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. She was- she would be at the church. I told him it was like she would be, you know, the person to take provide for him at church, and I was the one that took care of the home front, and that's what he wanted. He didn't need he didn't need that at church because he already had a staff in place. He already had people on assignment to do things, so he didn't need to move anybody to push me there to just make me be function in that work. And is this the relationship that he basically had? I mean, from what you see, from what you know, I know you can't speak for the other wives. All three of his wives were pretty much in that same role, not in, and not as co-pastors or co-laborers that he just wanted them to be his wife. I can't speak on them. Okay. I just know what he told me. He said, I don't like a nagging wife. <laughs> and <laughs> and he said, I want you to be by my side. I don't need a career person. You're going one way and I'm going another. Oh, okay. I got it. Okay. I, I totally understand that. All right. Now, what I want to do now is ask you a few more questions as it relates to your relationship with Pastor Deborah. In all of what has recently occurred, I, the first thing that everybody saw was this letter. This letter that hit the internet, it came out. And it really shook everybody, people who did not know Pastor Bishop Roy Brown, who did not know Pastor Crow, who did not know you at all. When we saw this letter, everybody had a different reaction to this letter. So I want to know, what is the relationship you have with Pastor Crow now as it relates to all of these changes um, um, as far as you being in the house, leaving, the decision making behind that? It, catch us up. Give us the part we don't know. Well, I can't fill you in on what I don't know because I really don't know what happened. I do know that they tried to have a board meeting on August 6th and to have some discussion with me, and I had council present, and the, um, the church board did not agree to have a meeting with council present. So you had a and lawyer there. That was, that was what we reported. We heard that there was yes. a lawyer there, so you did have a lawyer there. Yes, I had council present. Okay which everyone should, whatever you do, you can have counsel at anything you want to do in life. Right. So tell us about that meeting. It's not against the law. But anyway, so then they, uh, they, they voted not to have the meeting because of counsel. Um, and then they, they met again on August 12th. I wasn't a part of that meeting when the board met. And then on August 17th, that Friday, then this paper is in the screen door, which says the things that you read. So I don't know. I, I really don't know what transpired, but they, they had already had their discussions. Uh, I never met their attorney. And also at the first meeting, I told them then, if you don't want counsel present at the meeting, then your counsel and my counsel can yeah, sit and discuss. That's proper. Because that would only be fair. Because right. Because I honestly, my husband only wanted me to be a wife. I wasn't involved in any church affairs. I don't know anything about church business. I did what he requested of me. That was my assignment with him, to cook, to clean, to be there for him, to comfort him, to uh, honor him, and be a part of his life outside of the church. To me, it's, And yes, he loved church, and he was I, at church a lot, but once he got ill, he was home most of the time. So I'm that's t- when my part even kicked in even more. I'm going to tell you this, and I don't know how this is going to sound to you, but to me, you sound like a maid. You don't sound like no way. I, and that, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, you know, and, and I love you, but, you know, I'm just straightforward. It, that don't, what in the world is I that? Understand. I don't understand it. That's, you go, listen, I had hired help for that. I want, I want my wife for Aww. sex. I want my wife for the, the <laughs> rub my head. Both of them. I want my wife to rub. I, I want my wife to. I mean, to go to the movies with me. Cooking is good because right, when your wife. Remember, right, but remember when. Right, when you get married and the Bible says the two become one, they become one with what you want for your relationship. 
Well, what did you want? Relationship, he was very clear on what he wanted me there for. He didn't need me interfering with what he had at church. His, his stuff was working well, and they were doing what he asked them to do. And that was there was a short period where I actually was principal for his school, um, his uh, former principal. She uh, remarried, and she relocated, and I have my principal's license, and he asked me to run the school right before he closed it. For a short time, I was there about three, four years. So at that time, I, I saw him, but I was still in the school all day, and he did whatever church matters, church business they conducted. So I wouldn't completely say I was a, uh, a maid. It's just that he had his separate part of his day for okay. the church stuff, and then he has his life with me. I, got I it. think that's fair. Whatever you need for your relationship, the Bible says that the wife is there to supply your needs, right? Your mate, the one that you chose. So when he chose me, that's what he wanted at that time in his it. life. Now, I don't know about the other season, but at the time when I <laughs> met him, that's what he wanted. Okay. And I... he didn't want me to work, too, for those people that kept saying, you don't go to work. You don't go to work. You don't have a job. That was his request. Right. I am licensed and trained. I, I have many degrees, and I have certificates. So for the people that put that out there, you know, thank you for even putting my name out there some more. Appreciate you. Right. Okay, let me let me say this. Oh, I'm going to say one thing. Let me ask you this, and I'm going to move to something else. I guess it's just the counselor side. I got 20-something years of counseling. What in the whole hell and the heaven did you want? I hear what you're talking about, what he wanted. But what did you want? When the man's ways please God, right? Okay. So I am the one that was there following what I was taught biblically before I met him. Okay. Then once I married him, I knew what the Bible said, and I followed the Bible. Got I it. was 33 when I got married. Prior to marrying him, sure, I was one of those people that fell in love with someone who didn't love me back. So this time, I did it God's way. So that's, that was my mantra. Whatever the Bible said, that's what I was going to do. And the Bible said I was supposed to meet my husband's needs and do the things of God that was listed in the scriptures. And that's what I stuck to. Got it. And I still believe that today. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with what you believe. I just wanted to know from for me because for me that's a little dip that's a little different okay but still i think okay i still think that you are high uh, such a high holy woman because i'm telling you you got to have a whole bunch of jesus but for to do what you have done you are full of in fact i need for you after this to pray for me i want you to take my name and put <laughs> on because you got some power with god and patience and some other stuff i ain't got okay now all right, let's take well, a look. Well, if we put God as the head and do what he said do, then that's when he'll take care of us. So that's, that's a man's change, man's ideas change, but God is the same today and yesterday and always. So I followed what the Bible said. Got it. So Contrary for, to popular belief. Right. So getting back to the question I asked, so your relationship with Pastor Crow basically was business. You, you saw her doing business. You stayed out of it. She, she was work for Bishop. Yeah. Right. All right. Now, so when the letter showed up, get back to this. So when the letter showed up and how, how did you find the letter or did somebody else find the letter that was on your door? No, I found the, I opened the door. I saw the letter in the door. I went to check the mail and I saw the letter in the screen. You could fit it in between the bars. There's a screen and then there's an actual wooden door to the house. And I took it out the screen and I read it and I was I was shocked. I was, mm -hmm. I was disappointed. I was traumatized. I was, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what is this? Had you, because had you. Because remember, we had met August 6th and nobody said anything about that then. Wait a minute. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. I'm just, I'm just hearing what you said. You mean to tell Larry mm -hmm. D. Reed that you, this is August the 20th and 1st. So they had the meeting August the 6th. And then the letter just showed up at your house. Remember, the board called for a meeting with me. There was the board, and Pastor Deborah was present, and another bishop was present. Then they didn't want to meet because council was there. They, I, I wasn't going to meet with them without council. So then the next time the board met was the 12th. So they had two meetings. So they had plenty of days to share with me, uh, we need you out, you know, whatever, however they were going to put it. 
You know, I thought it would have been more compassionate and more humane to take me aside and say, you know what, Paula, we need we need you to move out of the house as soon as you can. But, I mean, it would have been nice to say stay there as long as you can. But I didn't get either one. I just got a letter in the door. Okay, let's let's talk about that. And, and let me say this. And because everybody's saying, you know, okay, she did have a meeting. She did know. She signed paperwork. You say you never, your niece said that you never signed anything. I've never signed anything. We, two, in 2016, uh, my husband came out of the hospital against medical advice. This was shortly before he lost the next leg. As soon as I got home, I had to pick up medicine. I get a call. They're having a meeting. Paula, hurry up and get back to the house. So I rush back to the house, and there is some of the board, and they're saying they need to meet with me. And I'm wondering, how? how? We just left the hospital. Bishop is sick. We have medicine. But I said, fair enough. And at that meeting, his daughter and some other people are sitting in an adjacent room. So I thought if this was going to be a private meeting about my life, I mean, I, I, just, I was a little bit stunned. But anyway, at that time, they told me, if Bishop closes his eyes in 30 days, you have to move. And I thought, wow, I'm dealing with my husband and his serious ailments and sickness. I've been at the hospital with him staying with him, and when he decides he wants to go, he wants to go, that's it, and we come home, and you, we haven't gotten settled, and this is what I'm being told. I don't know who decided, who told who what, but that's what I was told. So, so at that I, point, I didn't say anything other than, I mean, I, I can't believe this. So I you, haven't signed anything. I was told they recorded me, unbeknownst to me, but I don't know. I didn't sign anything. So let me ask you this. So you were never told at all during the course of the marriage, you know, when Bishop was well, from anybody in the administrative department, the staff, Pastor Crow, that if your husband died, you would be homeless. Nobody ever said anything close to that. No. He, oh, in the beginning of the marriage, that is correct what you heard. He did he stand did. in the pulpit and tell the people, if something happens to me, Paula gets that house. My wife is taken care of. No one has to take care of my wife. I've got it. My wife gets the house. If you talk to several of the congregants or wherever they are now, they will tell you that. That's not made up. That is correct. I don't know what happened in 2016. There were people that were uh, telling my husband all kinds of things and allegations and innuendos and causing all kind of discord amongst the us as a couple as well as among the brethren hold on now I this is this is this is what i this is what i heard we're gonna keep on with this but this is what i heard i want sure. you to be i want you to be able to deny or or say this was true it was said the rumors sure. were that what was said reported emailed to me was that you cheated on him you abused him you beat him and all these things <laughs> This is what I'm saying to you. See, I didn't want to get into that because I'm trying to cover, you know, I'm trying, you know, I, I, this whole thing wasn't even to tear the church down or to make a skeptical or to ruin my husband's legacy. So I, I'm trying to be my best to Okay, you only say whatever you feel causing. comfortable but, but with But you're saying. actually correct. They said that and more. And someone reported me to APS for adult, uh, abusing the bishop. I have been cleared of all charges. I am not an adulterer. I did not take his money. The, and I'm not going to mention her name, but you did you did have her speak already. But anyhow, life goes on. I was cleared of the charges. Okay, and so, it's sad who, because so, that's, so, the man is sick. Think about this, Mr. Reed. The man is ill. This is the great leader, the great pastor, the anointed vessel, the prophet, the preacher, the entrepreneur, the healer, all that. And he's not well. And then... Some people decide this is the time to tell him all kind of foolishness. Mm -hmm. you, did, you, did you even think about why he had a third wife? Because these people have been doing this all mm -hmm. along. You fill his head with nonsense, but he was well then, and he just moved on. Now he's ill, and he's mm -hmm. being told his wife is fooling around and doing this, that, and the other. I have been mm -hmm. by his side. I even took care of his aunt, who had a stroke, and she lived with us for a while, and she was paralyzed. She was on a peg. I lift people. I lifted him, her. I took care of my mom before she passed. I'm a caregiver. I've been a yeah. caretaker all my life. I've still, mm -hmm. I raised my nieces and nephews, and I still made time to do school and do something with myself. So here I'm married to this great man of God, and then the people around him. So it's not the whole church, Mr. Right. Uh, Mr. Reed. Right. Some people around decide this is the time we're going to tell him nonsense about his wife. Was this and staff, he began staff to believe people? it. Because they told him, huh? This was staff people? Huh? This was staff, people that he trusted. 
it, I'm going to say people around him because, you know, it is what it is. Who, you who was, you, you're going to say it's alleged, right. but this is, alleged. this is how it goes down. They start telling him things, and my husband starts asking people, do you think my wife is trying to kill me? Do you think my wife is fooling around on me? Wow. So, you know, this, this, this is true, and it's sad, and it's disgusting that, you know, people of God that, you know, I think who are my family, alleged, you know, spiritual family, would mm-hmm. do this to my husband at this time. I was, I was so saddened by this. I spent many days crying, but I still had to focus to take care of him without being upset. Who? And, and, you know, I could have I just walked off because they had this man believing these things. Let me ask you this. I'm not going to say who, because, you know, everybody's going to stick up for everybody. And it's like how the police have a code blue. That's how it goes down. And even people who were who were in the room that heard things could have said something in my defense. And no one ever did. Jesus cleared me. Not anybody in particular. Jesus did that. Question. And that's why I can I can stand with proudness that I don't have to worry about telling no man. Thank you. I can thank the Lord for that. Well, see, this is this is the reason why just for the things you say that you did. I say you're a phenomenal mm-hmm. woman and you are to be praised. Question, the, the money, who was handling as a married couple? Did you have any knowledge of Bishop's money, his assets? Like when he died, were you able to go to the bank account and pull cash out? Was your name on the accounts? How was that set up? The only, the only, the only time my husband ever had an account was when he became disabled and that was in 2005 when he had the kidney failure. He never had a bank account that I know of. He did a lot of deals. And I don't know, I guess they had church bank accounts. As I told you, I don't know those things. And he would get his Social Security check, and that's what we would use for any incidentals. Like uh, he liked having uh, soul food or something, and he didn't like what was cooked, and you have to go and get it. So but the he, church um, so the had church. that money each month. Social Security. I don't know about the rest of the money. And from time to time, preachers would come and bless my husband because they remember his kindness to them. And they were like, Bishop, this is for you. Don't use it for the church. And every time someone gave my husband money, he gave it to the church because they always had bills and he always wanted to make sure the church was taken care of. There is no money stashed anywhere. Lady Brown. There's no pot of gold under the house. Okay, Lady Brown. So... Mm -hmm. The church took care of all of his living expenses, and the only money that you saw him handle was Social Security and money that people gave over there. Did you were you able to take any money for yourself and put back and save? He, when he got his money from the church for the week, he would give me an allowance, and the allowance was to run the household. It was to buy the groceries, take the things that close to the cleaners whatever other things was needed, and he kept the part for himself. And again, it's pretty much recycled money because people are blessing the bishop. We right. go places, yeah, his birthdays, his anniversary, convention. He gives back to, he always did. He gave everything to the house of the what, Lord. His what, best, you're I got, absolutely right. He loves what, it. What kind of car were you driving? I heard that you had a Mercedes. I drive and a don't, Honda. I drive a Honda Accord. But didn't, they, didn't you have a Mercedes and they took your Mercedes during the course of his sickness? When I first married Bishop, he leased vehicles, which I didn't know, and I had a car, and he showed up at my job with a a Mercedes that was leased, which I didn't know. But anyway, I gave my car to the church, and I thought, wow, oh, my goodness, I didn't ask you for a car. And he goes, no, if I'm driving one, you're going to drive one. Mm -hmm. So that's how that started. I wasn't a wife that came in and said, buy me a Mercedes, buy me a BMW, buy me a Jaguar, all that. My husband wanted me to drive that car. And so I gave my Honda to the church at the time, and I was driving the Mercedes. All the way up until when? When did they take it? Um, Every time the lease is up, your car is changed. And so right before he got sick, he had a BMW. I had the Honda, and I was driving the BMW. And the BMW was given back to the church. Well, they asked for it, and they turned it in. And I went to driving my Honda. Okay, I want you to ask the question for me, and I know it'll be a, it will be alleged because I'm not able to ask the actual person. But it was said to me, and I'm just asking, but it was said to me that Pastor Crow has built two new houses in the last year, moved her family into the church property, and she has a Bentley, a Mercedes, and a Range Rover. Is that true? <laughs> I don't know what Pastor drives. Um, I don't know her personal business. She's the pastor of the church, and she can speak for herself. 
It was also said to me that when Bishop turned, when he died, Pastor Crow became the sole, I guess, owner or CEO over a, of about fifty million dollars worth of property, a portfolio. Do you know if that is true? I do not. Okay, so this is my concern, and this is what I ask you: Is there a way? Do you have representation where they can say, oh, hold on, let me ask, before I get to that. It was said that the church acquired a $100,000 um, uh, life insurance policy. I don't know when they acquired it. And it sounds like to me, if they acquired it, they probably acquired it while he was sick and it probably cost a whole lot of money to pay for it. They were paying for $1,700 a month to, for him to be taken care of. That's what was said. Is that true? Yeah. Is that true? No. Now, I don't know what they paid for anybody. There were part-time workers from the church that came different days. I, I wasn't responsible for their salary. I have no idea. And as far as the insurance policy, yes. I, I've never said that my husband didn't provide for me. That was put out there by yeah, other by people. By his, his daughter. The, yeah. the notice was the whole point of how all of this spun out of control. The fact that something could be placed on a door in public space for everybody to see, not in an envelope, right. not confidential, right. placed on a door. When I go to the church every week, I go Wednesday, I go Sunday. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You, you, you still attend the church? Well, after the notice, I, I did not go this Sunday. After the notice, I didn't. I was, I was very brokenhearted behind that, so I did not go Sunday. But I was up until then. Girl, I was what you made time. out of? I, what, what are you made out of? I ain't never seen. What are you made out of? I would have got four, five, six different guns. In fact, no, I wouldn't have done that. Not in your position. But I would have called some some of them Rastafarians over there in, uh, <laughs> in Queens and said, y'all go down there and handle that. Okay, so hold on. All right. I'm sorry. I'm I just think like that. I'm sorry. Let me no, answer you know, your question. You know, I mean, if, if you talk to people, the people that truly listen when the word of God is taught, because you go from lesser truth to greater truth. And you being a Christian is being Christ-like. So we not, you know, being in this world, he said, the greatest command I give you is that you love one another. He didn't put us here to be fighting one another, warring You're with right. one another. That is You're about right. love. You're so right. If, if you are a true Christian, You're whatever right. your, you know, area is Baptist, Pentecostal, you're right. it doesn't matter. You well, are a Christian. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think you have been handled? Do you, but do you think, but do you think you've been handled in love and as a Christian? Do you think that? Go ahead, answer. Um, you can be no. honest. No, I, I, I don't. I don't. Okay. I For, think that, on, on, I think that, it's sad that, but this read, you have to remember this. And I, I, I think that sometimes, you know, when people say every, there's always a Judas because Jesus had a Ju Judas. And um, you just never know the people who are part of your life that you love and you think are here to help you and, and, and help you go live a better life. And I think when things happen that you get to the place and you understand they crucified Jesus. They talked about him. They, they, he, the, the, they, the, the same people that said Hosanna, Hosanna. The next week they were ready to crucify him. So that's a lesson well learned that I have learned from my walk with the Lord. That sometimes things will happen, but they don't happen except God allow them to happen. And I can't change people. I can change the way that I deal with people. Right. Gotcha. So I work on me, and I pray for others. I pray one for another that I might be healed. So Has any bishop, okay, let me talk about E. Bernard Jordan. E. Bernard Jordan, we know, is 50, dirty, nasty, stinking, breath wit, rich. I mean, he got all kind of riches and values. Has any bishop reached out to you and say, look, let me buy, give, Bishop Jordan got houses. I know he's got rid of one big, huge one. You know, a little time ago, I seen on Periscope. Has any bishop reached out to you, any an officer of the Lord's church, all this love and Jesus stuff that you're talking about? that we all supposed to have. Has anybody done for you? You white Bishop Hind Park, you gave him enemas, you done this, that, and the other for years. Has anybody white you since this happened? <laughs> Not, listen, um, I think that pa pa the Bible says that we have to hold fast to the faith, fight the good fight of faith, right? 
and people have their own convictions and people have their own ministries and I think there's also protocol at a certain point and um has Deborah called the, you to give you a check from the church make that's what I'm sorry please, please, has please, Deborah please, say it again has Deborah called has, you has to Deborah give you said a, anything to me has she given you a check Since Recently, the death of no. Bishop from the church, has she given you a check? Yes, since the death of Bishop, yes. Oh, she's so Pastor Deborah has given you a check since the death of Bishop. Yes. How much would that? Oh, if you don't mind, is that the hundred thousand dollar insurance well, check? Well, I will. Well, that wasn't. That's mailed to you from the insurance people. Okay. And I don't. I mean, I don't want to. As I said, the whole thing got started because of a letter of eviction. Question. And I believe that there's a way of handling things, Mr. Reed. There's a way. Oh, yeah. You, there's a, there I agree. There's a humane side and a respect yeah. that people should give one another. Especially after and 23 yes, during the years. leader is not here anymore. I but agree. that's why they have a board, right? I the don't board agree. Sits and they're supposed to discuss this why you this way you don't go off tangent. Everybody has to give account to somebody. So that's why there's a board. So you sit and you meet and you decide what you're going to do. People are upset because the letter said from Pilgrim Church. There are people that, that go to Pilgrim Church that said if the if this letter is supposed to represent us, why didn't we know about the letter? Absolutely. So getting back to what is causing everybody to spiral out of control is the issue of if you're going to give the wife of the, the the leader, the founder of a movement, a letter, you should have reached out and shared with the people in the pews or the bishops. Or the who, however, I don't know the protocol, which is what I shared with you. That I try to mind my business because I stayed in my lane as his wife because for the best results, you follow instructions. He mm. told me what he wanted from me as a wife. So for people to try to uproot that and make him think otherwise, I was his wife. I was everything he asked me to be as a wife. Clear. Now, why don't people know how to stay in their lane, be everything you're supposed to be as a daughter, as a congregant, as a whatever. Be what you're supposed to be and stay in your lane. You did so there well. Was this letter and you, you and did it well. been handled differently. You That's did. what this whole thing is about. Y yes, you're right. But, but listen, you did well. Listen. You 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 are X Men. Uh, what's the thing? The legends on um the DC. You, you you did well. Can't nobody say you did. Just the thing. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let me get back to the question. I can say that after you get off the phone. But I don't. So, this is this the reason why I share this with you because I can't speak for other leaders, and I am not here to tear down anybody's ministry or clear. to promote anybody's ministry or big up one person over another. The point that everybody should stay focused on, and that's why I'm speaking to you tonight, because right. I was going to write something on Facebook, and I said, no, I'm going to take the time with you, because I didn't go to counsel. My Lord, nobody doesn't even know I'm talking with you other right. than my niece that you spoke to yesterday from England. Right. So think about this. All the way from England, people are upset. Yeah. And the issue is you you have a woman that has been a part of your ministry, a part of your life, a part of your leader's life, the founder of an assembly's life, and she's given a letter that's telling her to leave within 10 days. And, yes, there's other parts to an eviction process because I've heard people mention yeah. a whole bunch of nonsense that, oh, that doesn't mean she has to leave in 10 days. The point is you shouldn't even be giving me a letter and putting it in the door like that. Right. Where is the respect? Where is the decency? Where are the morals? Where are uh, where is the love of God? Where's the love of Christ with this? I, you don't I, put a letter in the door. and you, I mean, then you want me to go to landlord court? What, what do you want from this? That, I knew I wasn't getting the house after that meeting in 2016. And I still took care of my husband. I still wiped his butt. He never had a bed sore. His skin was never broken. All of the charges that they put on me was cleared. The bishop was fine. He was clean. He didn't call anybody to come in here and take him from me because he was sick of me. So for that person that's putting out all those stupid stories, this, this is what people do when they want to evade the issue at hand. Stay Absolutely. focused on the issue. The issue was the letter went in the door for the public to see. I'm in the house. Okay, I'm going to move. I'm not begging you for anything because I believe the Lord will supply my every need. I'm Absolute not going to sit Luther. down there and say, Bishop gave me the house, then he took it away. For whatever reason, he changed, whether it was the innuendo, the allegations. Wait, 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 wait. I said earlier in the show, and I need to verify this. So you did know in 2016 that the house was not going to you because at that time you found out that it was now in Pilgrim's name. So it was in his name before and then it went to Pilgrim, right? Yes. 
I knew that. And okay. I still stayed here and did above and beyond what I needed to do. So uh, at least uh, show me some common courtesy. Agree. Okay, now, next question. So this this house, $3.5 million house, 12 rooms, they tell me, is a mm -hmm. very nice, wonderful house. And that's how you've lived all them years. So you stayed yes. after knowing that you would not receive the house. Bishop stood up in the pulpit yes. and said that he's going to give you the house, but he the house went from out of his name to the church's name. When did Bishop change yes. his mind and why? I just told you. It, when I heard about it, it was 2016. Now, I don't know if they had any private conversations. As I told you, I don't know church business, and he's been sick since 2005. Then 2016, when we came home against medical advice, when we left the house, and then about three weeks later, he lost the other leg, so we should have stayed in the hospital. And we came home that day because people convinced him he didn't need to be in the hospital. So there was always this back and forth, back and forth about what's right and what's not right and, and taking him all over the place. And I said, you know what? I'm going to stay focused on the things for my husband. I'm going to make sure his care is good. Whatever they say, I'm not, it's not, it's not going to deter me. It's not going to distract me. It's fine. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. You want the house? Keep the house. I don't know if Bishop agreed. I don't know if he disagreed. I do know that people remembered that. I was there when he said that, but that's fine. I didn't marry him for him to give me stuff or to right. give me things. Right. It was a godly situation. It was for Christ. The union was about kingdom work, ministry. It wasn't about what people are trying to say. Right. So yeah. can you imagine? Oh. I knew those things, those allegations were going on, and I was still here by his side. And he was not mistreated, and he was not abused. And you can check with the report for everybody that wants to know from APS. Check the report for 2016, and you will see Paula Scarlett Brown was cleared of all her charges. Right. People didn't know why they even initiated this report. Right. And those people will pay for what they did. Right. That and man probably went, Bishop Brown probably went to his grave still wondering, was I, wasn't I? But I can't do anything about that. Right. I can only be responsible for how I behave. And that's what I did, Mr. Reed. I behaved myself the best way I knew how. Like I said, during my speech, I said, I'm not the best person, but I did the best that I knew how to do. Mm. So you I don't know who else so, had a problem so with you that. So receive, you receive $100,000 from insurance. And then Pastor Deborah yes, gave you a check. And did it, did it, yes, sir. I know you ain't going to tell us the amount, but was it more than the insurance? No, absolutely not. No. Well, what the heck? She was dead. No. Well, what the? Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There is, get, the, the church people pilgrim. People get off the topic. I, I get she that. I get off the topic. She's not giving me money now, okay? She gave me some courtesy for the time that she decided to do that. That's fine. It wasn't a big lump sum. It wasn't anything for me to go to Mexico with or buy a house in Italy or whatever. The, the 100000 from the insurance, yes, that comes straight from the insurance company. It doesn't even come from the church. They know the man is dead. The name was there. They sent it. Who paid it? More than likely, it was still my husband's money. He did not discuss those things with me. And I didn't need to because I wasn't with him to receive. I was with him to give. I gave my right. love. I gave my time. That's I gave clear. my life. You can't repay me for that. that. I know you. I know they can't repay you for it. But this is what I. I this is what I think. Somebody over there at Pip. I'm, I. I just almost switched. I almost went into my personality. But let me calm down a little bit. <laughs> they cannot pay you for it. But what in the whole hell and the heaven is the church doing? We all, and Pastor Deborah give you a little piece of that piece of check. What are y'all doing? What, what? Put Hudson up there. Bishop William Hudson, I don't know how much power you got. You probably ain't got no power. From what I understand with, Bishop, with this um, Pastor Crow, ain't nobody got no power over that $50 million worth of property except for her. Them built two, hot, allegedly, them built two brand new houses in the last year and a half, two years, got a Bentley, a, a Range Rover, and all the stuff. Stand up in the church according to your ni niece and say, I ain't scared of no niggas in here. To me, it looked like, and she could be a great woman, but just for me, from the outside, we need to hear her say something because she looking 
all kinds of crazy because she can write the check. I know what it is to be the admin person and have that person depend on. She's been in that fibers of that church 20 something years. She can get her hand on some money and write you a check. Sell that house. It's $3.5 million. Split the money and give it to you. So you gone on about yourself. And Pastor William Hudson, you need a f you got some money at least from Amen when you was on that show. Get some money from right these bitches and stuff. Call, put E. Bernard Jordan up there. Call E. Bernard Jordan and tell him to sell one of them Bentleys, one of them Rolls Royce $700,000 and give you $200,000. We need to hear from these bishops. Somebody need to do something because this ain't right. It ain't right. You ain't got to say it. Don't you say nothing because you say you holy and you feel. I'm saving holy feel, but I'm 2018, 2000, 2018 saving holy ghost feel. And this ain't right. This, this ain't right. I don't care how you put it. And I love you, Bishop Jordan. So I hope you I hope you go write a check after this here. Or get on Periscope and talk about with this stuff like you did with Brian Cohen and everybody else. Uh, bring all three of them over. And somebody need to do something. And I see y'all in this chat. You're talking about this fake news, she lying. I you got your you got your opinion, I got mine. I don't think this right. I don't think it's right. I saw you, Tim Clinton. We cool and we friends, but we ain't got to agree all the darn time. I don't agree with you. You know, you don't agree with me. This ain't right. It ain't right. I don't care how you turn it. It ain't right. This is not and right. Then, Wait a minute. I need one. I mean, one more added. minute. I need one more minute to fuss. Mm -hmm. This ain't right. It ain't right. It ain't right. It ain't right. It ain't right. Somebody need to sell a car, sell Bentley, Range Rover, and send this woman 23 years 15, 13, 15 years of taking care of somebody. I, I don't, listen, I, I love my wife of 18 years. She going and got married, going by her business. But if she got sick right now, I would take care of her. But Tom, it would be somebody I hired, uh, hired to wipe her hind part and to give her an animal. Then the way well, I'm doing that. And you did that. You <laughs> certain kind of woman. That you's a certain kind of woman. That, that, you need to be prayed. If I get to heaven and I don't see you sitting side there besides Jesus and you, uh, I'm, I'm going to have a problem because ain't no my life seen nobody nothing like this. This, this. What is this? Somebody need to do something. I don't put the link in there for the GoFundMe. We need to show these bishops what they need to be doing with their money. Y'all hit that GoFundMe link and start giving in increments of $100. If they, they not, a thousand of you on YouTube, a thousand of you on Facebook, and, and Lord, I need to get rid of this Periscope. There ain't but 11 people over there. <laughs> All oh, 11 y'all, that's $1,100. Over there, y'all need to get, this has been set up by her niece. This don't go to Coro. This don't go to Pilgrim Church. It don't go to Pilgrim Assemblies or whatever the name thing is. This ain't, this goes straight to the family. Y'all heard the niece calling, the niece calling here, she was crying. This, this is a crying shame. Yes. Yes. All right, I'm we finished. Were crying. We, Mr. Mr. Um, Mr. Reed, we, Mrs. Minister Reed, we had our crying time. We were crying almost every day here, even before this letter, because other things went down, but we don't need to discuss that. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could give you an answer to what was happening. I do know that some people thought it really nice to continuously sow discord amongst us, continually speak lies, and mm. cause all kinds of horrible things to take place here. And thank God for some of the people who saw that will speak up. I'm sure you will hear from them or they'll, they'll send you an email because I'm sure they're conscious at this point. If they didn't do anything that day, maybe they'll do something now because it has been, it has been a very, very, very difficult journey, especially being married to someone who becomes dependent on you. He, he's a double amputee. He's bedridden, and you have all these things to take care of with him. And then the people that are supposed to be a part of his life start these horrible stories about his wife. And if they have these people that they claim I've had the affairs with, bring them. If you have the papers that you think I've signed, bring it. Because I know I did not sign anything. Those are forgeries and those are liars. Let me, and let me tell you something. That, uh, let me tell you something. talking about they drove my husband. This, they were all kinds of drivers. We didn't have anybody all the time. They were different people. I saw all kinds of videos that people put out, people to send somebody. Yeah, I know. And they even called me a yellow witch. Yeah. Somebody but, out there called me a yellow witch. But this is the thing. Yeah, I know tell you, who that is. Let me tell you something. <laughs> this is how you, we don't know, I mean, because I'm listening to her story. 
I'm I'm team um uh what's the name here? I'm team Paula. Put up that that flyer that somebody tried. The Lord, they tried their best to do a flyer, and this flyer just all is number one. I don't know it, who did that. I don't know. They, they don't know how. It won't you. They had good intentions. Yeah, it won't you. It won't you called do Deuteronomy. I don't know what in the world it is. But I they, know. They, but it's okay. <laughs> they did their they best. Met, we, we, we know what the scripture is, and the Bible does talk about widows for those people yeah. that seem to be trying to call me a witch or whatever it is they want to talk about. Bishop chose me. I did not run after him. I told you the actual story, how it took place. He had to convince me. He, when he convinced me and I did it God's way, that's how I became his wife. I wasn't running him down. I wasn't wearing tight dresses, running down the aisle with my offering this and doing clear. flips and summer sauce. This is he clear. didn't even notice me. I was there for five years, and he didn't notice me for the time until he called me up to do the real estate. And another time he saw me at a church dinner, and he said, you go to this church? So for those <laughs> people that want to spread the lies, remember, you reap what you sow. And that's know, why I called in. I have no reason to lie. There was nothing to gain from this. And Think this, about it. At the end of the day, I knew nothing was, I didn't even know about the insurance, Mr. Reed. So I thank God for that. I'm not, I'm not wow. complaining that he didn't look out for me. He could have done otherwise. Yeah. That's all. And I'm talking about the issue of the paper. I needed time to grieve my husband. I have to go back to work Come now. On. I have to seek employment after being home from 2005. My back is out from lifting my husband. I'm not complaining about that because I know the Lord is a healer and he will touch me whenever he gets ready and take care of the things that are ailing me. But I needed some time. I needed time to grieve. I needed time. I've been going on job interviews in the month of June when my husband passed. Mm. And I go to therapy for the chiropractor for my back four times a week. But I'm, I'm not complaining. Because I know my family are workers. We didn't come to this country to steal from people, rob, mm -hmm. lie, and make up stories why you got to have money. We are hardworking women, the scarlet women in the family. So, I mean, I don't know where some of these people who have been mooching off the church and they, mm -hmm. they can't get a real job and then they come online and tell you that they've been working with my husband and telling you this, that about me. They can step to me face to face because I have no fear of no man. I fear the Lord. Mm-hmm. That's why I talk to you tonight. Let's set the record straight. The convict that's putting that nasty stuff out there, does he want me to, re to release his criminal record to you while he's telling you I'm a liar and I'm an adulteress? Mm -hmm. He's just mad because he couldn't get none. That's all. You know, let's not go there. Mm -hmm. Let's not go there. Paula okay. is ready. Okay. I have done enough, and I've taken care of my husband, and I've done the things of God, and I'm talking to you out of love and respect. My niece spoke to you. I didn't even know she was going to call you. And that's God allowing people to come forth with the truth, authentic truth. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the thing, and this is what I try to do with Larry Live, and people get upset with it, and people have not understood why I left 20 years of pastoring and began to go into entertainment with music, and, and um, so I'm working on some stuff with some film, and, and doing this entertainment thing, and really about to take it off somewhere. I wanted people to be able mm -hmm. to say, what they're thinking about whatever it is whether it's pop culture whether it is church or what have you and when this story came across i i reported it i put the facts out there and then I, by the end of the show i, tr I then i try to hold my point of view and i let people call in mm -hmm. and people are calling in now i guess wanting to say something but this is the thing and i'm, I'm gonna allow you um, to actually get off the line before i start taking any more calls because i don't want nobody to say anything to you you have already dealt with enough. I don't want no. I don't want you answering no questions that somebody may have because if if I didn't think to answer them, oh well, you know. So, <laughs> but I I really I I wanted to create this platform that, and this is why I wanted to interview you. I don't like people to be bashed. Now somebody may say I bash. No, mm -hmm. I just say my opinion. I'm never going to be malicious towards Bye. somebody. But I respected Bishop Brown when I met him. Some years ago, mm -hmm. and and I mm -hmm. and um, Pastor Jackie McCullough is one of the reasons why I even know what who he is, and mm -hmm. and Bishop McKinnon and some of the rest of them, and Oren Poolings and some of the rest of them who are great people. Oren Poolings and his wife Medina, superb people, superb people. If you ever hear any lie on them, it's a lie. There's no that's a lie. And so and yeah. so this I know I met him then, and I just knew him by the spirit in that swift moment. So by no means are we set trying to destroy 
you know, any legacy that he had. But the reality is this need to mm -hmm. be a lesson for every pastor, every bishop. I've heard, got emails from first ladies. This is a normal thing that happens in black churches. Once the bishop died, the pastor died, the first lady is thrown to the dogs. Bishop G. E. Patterson is the only person I can think of right now that handle things for Louise properly. Well, she's still getting paid right now, making some decisions and, and just a portion of his business mm -hmm. concerning bountiful mm -hmm. blessings. This was handled mm -hmm. improperly. You don't have to say it. I know you ain't going to say it no way, um, uh, Paula, but I'm going to say it. The <laughs> Bishop, Bishop, and you can hear me over there on the other side. You didn't handle this right. Just let me see it, you know, because he, he didn't handle it right. Now, we love him, but this was handled improperly because there are people who don't love your wife the way you loved her or respect her the way that you, res you respect her. Because if you ask me, I, I don't know if he, I don't know. How, he had a different kind of love for you because the kind of love that even my, I, my wife, we were married 18 years. She's divorced. She's already married. Got, got her, uh, she married a woman. Everybody know because online. She went and married, married a woman. But this is the thing. Mm -hmm. Mom, there's no way. And if somebody mess with her right now, anybody, they're going to have to deal with Larry Reed. You know why? We were oh. married 18 years. I made her daddy a mm -hmm. promise. Her mama and her dad is dead. And although we get into, mm -hmm. we've gotten to it sometimes, get on each other's nerves highly, but the thing is, am I going to mess with her? Because I'm going to try to kill you. So I don't really understand the kind of love that Bishop had for you. It probably was in the religious framework to where he just highly respect you. That's my opinion. You ain't got to say none of that. But to me, I don't think he handled this like a husband. He handled it like... A, a visionary, a bishop, and just had his staff to handle it and thought they're going to do what's best. But Deborah Crow, William Hudson, you got, and whoever else is around, well, Bishop um, Bernard Jordan done left. He done put in his paperwork. He gone. You know, so he really ain't responsible, but I would just like for him to sell one of them cars and give her a check and send me about um, 300K too. But uh, <laughs> give her a check. I, I, that's, that, I, you know, y'all got to do something. And we're going to be asking. And somebody said this is unfair journalism because of what I'm saying. This is the only person that came to say something. I would be fair with Deborah Cole. Crow, I would treat her nice. I would handle her well. Y'all know when Juanita Bynum called into the show and Brian Carn, Brian Carn called into the show, I talked to Wendy Bottom and how she was handled last time. Okay, I know that was a little funny, but I won't handle nobody. You see how I'm handling this, this precious woman? I would handle them the same way, but I'm going to ask real questions. I'm going to ask you. And I'm not going to try to destroy you. I'm not a person to destroy people. They, they pictures and text messages and rumors folks send all the time. I ain't doing that mess. If it ain't public, public information, and then we're talking about Larry not doing it. But Tom, one thing I will do is tell you what I think and tell you when I think you off and you crazy. And Bishop, I'm, you know, I love you, but you didn't handle this right. And Deborah, you're going to get what's coming to you. Cause if you don't have you, if you don't do something for this lady, you ain't you ain't even matched the hundred thousand. Why does the Pilgrim Church got fifty something million dollars worth of property and broke? Is that what it is? The way y'all can't do nothing? Well then, Deborah, you need to go sell one of them houses you just built in the last two years, brand new. Get rid of that Bentley and them car. Something, something. There got to be some cutbacks to take care of this widow. This ain't right. Now, thank you, Paula. Well. Oh, go ahead. You got something. Thank you. And, and, remember, and no, I just wanted to share with you, you know, when you were talking about, you know, what he wanted from a wife. Think about it. I'm the third wife. I don't know what happened with wife one and wife number two. But remember, he's still in this same environment. And those marriages were broken up. And yeah. our marriage was almost destroyed. Yeah. And so I don't know the, the, um, the motivation behind it. And I guess, as I said to you, anything, things can happen except God allow it. But I know when you love somebody, you love who comes with them. Like, I'm so proud of you for saying that you love your wife still and you, would, you fight for her and yeah. you, you recognize that she has moved on with her life because that's what love is. Love builds. Love doesn't destroy. And if you love someone, whatever comes with them, you, if it's genuine love. But if it's conditional True. and you were waiting to receive something or you had an ulterior motive or you were misguided, then things that you put on the agenda for that situation become skewed. 
because your mind is thinking elsewhere. Uh, my husband was a visionary. I was a part of his life to be there with him, to celebrate with him. I will honor his legacy always. That Nobody can take that away. He was mm-hmm. anointed man. The things that God used him to do for the people to, to see those magnificent buildings and souls get saved. Remember, mm-hmm. he says, wise when it's souls. He oh, did the commission of a minister with a call, and he was a pastor to pastors. He was a father to many. No one can deny that. Agree. Sometimes the people in your circle, and we all have to take stock of that, the people who surround you, be mindful of them because this is how things unfold. Because what if he did live, leave things in place? But I would never know because he chose to keep me separate from that life for whatever reason. It might be that he was protecting me. I don't know. True. I've learned in life sometimes when people don't tell you everything, it's for your own good. So I did what I was supposed to do. I have no regrets for giving him everything, my, my energy, my time, my money. When he married me, I had a bank account. I shared. I loved him. I looked out for him. I loved the people that were part of his life, his family. No one is walking around telling you that I hated them. But you do hear these allegations. So it's on them. Whatever it is they're choosing to do at this moment where we should be honoring him and reverence him and doing everything we can to show people how great this man of God was and the ministry that he did and the words that he left his sermons, that's what we should be hearing now. You shouldn't be hearing that his wife got an eviction notice. And I've mm. looked at apartments, and you, you said it yourself the last time. New York is very expensive. Mm. No one wants to rent to a woman that hasn't been working since 2005. Mm. So I'm trying to buy something. Things are expensive in New York. I only know New York. Somebody told me I should move to another state. I'm waiting to hear from the Lord. But I really thought that I would have some time to grieve my husband, to get myself together, to get my health together. But it's mm. fine because, you know, it is what it is. You can't make people do what you want them to do. No. You just go to God and pray, and you do the best for yourself, and that's why I share that with you. I, have, I haven't even really gotten the time to grieve because yeah. so many yeah. things transpired, Mr. Reed, that I can't even tell you. You're, we're just dealing with the paper today, but a lot of stuff went down the pipeline. And I just thank God that I'm in my right frame of mind. I know that I'm a child of God. I know that God loves me, and he said he'll be with me always, even until the end, and that's what I hold on to. Jesus is real for me. I have a relationship. I don't have religion. So I don't know why someone thinks that all of a sudden Jesus, uh, Bishop introduced me to Jesus. I knew Jesus before I met him. I learned about worship and praise and fasting and prayer at Pilgrim. That was a foundation for me. I was a member, and I grew in God's word there. I'll never forget those times. Whatever anyone's trying to do now, they're, they're, they have to answer to God. I'm just doing what's right. And my family was very disturbed by this. Tanya was very broken that a church could do that. To, to place a letter on a door and ignore her like if she was nothing and no one. And that's cool. If that's what they choose to do, I leave them in the hands of the Lord. I forgive them all, and I will be out of the place. And whatever they want to do with it, I wish them well. You can't take any of this with you to the grave. But I'm glad that I have people in my life that love me, and I can say my family and my friends truly love me, and I'm, I'm a blessed woman because of that. And I thank you for allowing me this time to share. And anyone else that wants to know something, you got my address. Come and see me as long as I'm still here. Yeah, the whole I have world no got problem it. answering you. I got no problem. The Lord is my protector. Yeah. If you want to come here and straighten business, whichever way you think you want to straighten it with me, <laughs> I am here ready anytime. Look, lady, I have taken care of the bishop. That was the hardest job of my life. Yeah, lady and Paula. I finished my assignment. I kept the faith and I kept the course and I finished my assignment and I thank the Lord. Ain't nobody going to mess with you right now. <laughs> ain't nobody going to mess with you. You can be fine. I, if they, if, shoot, I'd be scared of angel standing at your door as holy and saved and sanctified next to Jesus as you is. Ain't that 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 is something there. Let me say this um, to you as I let you go. I'm gonna answer. Take some phone calls. A few of them. I don't have but a, a few min- minutes mm-hmm, left. Mm-hmm, Thank you mm-hmm. so much for trusting me um, to do an interview with you. And mm-hmm. sharing, and thank you. You didn't. I don't think you said anything that would be harmful or bashing to anybody. You conducted yourself well. Thank you so much for the service that you gave to the church. If you don't never hear it from nobody else, me and a whole lot of people that is online right now, about 2,500 people are online and we are going to give. It, I'm asking everybody that is on. A lot of you is like looking to see what's going on. But I want the GoFundMe is pinned under the Facebook stream and I've posted it a few times in the YouTube. Go right now. 
you see the counting is happening in um in your and euros and pounds i think it is because her yes. niece has set this up but go and yes. give something to assist her she's received one hundred thousand dollars from insurance and pastor deborah gave her a little piece of um, nothing check and ain't none of these bishops gave her nothing else. She <laughs> said it out her mouth. Ain't nobody else gave her nothing else. And, and so we gonna give her something. And then Bishop Bernard Jordan is gonna sell um, one of his cars and give her the money. Um, huh? Uh, wait, and Bishop Reed, Bishop, I'm um, sorry, Mr. Reed, Archbishop uh, Jordan during the convention did give me a check for twenty-five thousand. However. For those of you that don't know, my husband a month before made a pledge in front of and many people um, saying that I have to give Archbishop Jordan $25,000. So when he and his wife gave that check to me, I don't do my stuff publicly because that's why they like running their mouths because they don't know the whole story. So that I would like to clarify that tonight. Mm -hmm. I gave them the check and I said, no one knew that I had prayed about this, that my husband doesn't didn't owe anybody anything. You were the last person that he promised money to. And even though I need the money, this was my husband's promise to you. So please check, take this check on behalf of the late Archbishop Brown. And he didn't want to take it, but I told him, please, I said that to God. I didn't say that to anybody. Nobody knew that prayer. And since mm -hmm. God blessed me, I must complete my husband's yeah. legacy so that he can rest in peace. So for the people that's right. putting it out there, that I get, they don't know what I do because I don't announce stuff. I'm not into publicity. So for those that think that this, I'm doing this for attention, I, I'll share the news with you. If I was married to him for 22 years and you didn't hear anything until some of you decided to report me to the government, that speaks mm -hmm. well of my character and my life and my assignment and my ministry to Roy Brown. I was there to minister unto him, not to anybody else, and I did my assignment. Archbishop Bernard Jordan is saying right now presently that you are a holy woman and you are telling the truth. Now let me tell you all this. Yes, in. I am. There ain't but a few people in this world that I've sold money into. And that's Bishop Jakes and Bishop Bernard Jordan. Oh, yeah, Marilyn Hickey and Joyce Myers. But but I'm talking about the, uh, you know what I mean. But them ain't but two of the men, aside from my spiritual father and, 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 and Bishop and stuff years ago, that I have sold into that I seen on TV, I believed. You say what, you know, because they talking about Bishop Jordan bad. You know, he's supposed to be a witch and some everything. But I believe what this man here said. And he said, that prophesied our black president, he said, I mean, like 10, 15 years before it happened, even car to piss and what they're doing now, 25, 159 years before it happened. He said she's a holy woman of God. And what she is saying is the truth. That settles it. That settles it for me. I know my spirit won't roam. That settles it for Larry Reed and for LRF followers. So we're gonna hit this GoFundMe. It's set up by her niece. It's going straight to her. You heard her niece on the video last night. Let me tell you, I had to go pray in tongues and cry and get that thing and birth that thing and pray that girl told me up. She told me, <laughs> she told me up and she started crying. I said, I just can't, I just can't. You know, so we're gonna hit this GoFundMe. I want you guys Go get your savings, find your credit card, and hit that GoFundMe hard. And if all of you bishops that got her phone number, your spiritual father, great man. But in my opinion, and I know y'all gonna send me to hell for this, I think you got this wrong. So it's your job as a spiritual son to cover your father and pick up, make up the gap where he messed it up so he can sleep in peace. How about that? Thank you so much, Lady Paula, for taking um, time Thank you. And, and with this interview. God bless you. God bless you. I All pray right. it's for God's glory and our good. God bless you. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a few calls. What is it? I can, that's a whole lot. I can't, no, we, I can't do that. I'm going to take a few calls. But you have your name, where you're calling from, one minute. And I don't, you don't have to, you know the show, you don't have to agree. You can say whatever you want to say. But after one minute, we hitting the X. So we, cause we ain't got but 15 minutes. So that's 15 calls. All right. Quick, fast, and in a hurry. Let's go. 
Call it in and in 8447. Actually, we can we can go beyond the time. It just won't be on the radio side of the show. Um, call it in and in 8447. What's your name? Where are you calling from? You have one minute. God bless you, Brother Luke Lang. Uh, uh, listen, first of all, I worked for Tobin Church years ago and uh, with Bishop Brown. Bishop talk. Roy Brown. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, talk up louder. Okay. Yeah, I, I worked for the church. And, uh, and speaking to Bishop Roy Brown, Bishop Roy Brown was nothing short of a man of a man of God. He was a man of God extraordinary. I believe that. Um, like Sister Paula said, like Sister Paula said, she learned fasting and praying in the through him. Now listen, Larry, I know you're a man of God, so you know about the word and know about nomenclature mm -hmm. and you know about meanings and names and so forth and so on. Yeah. His name was Roy Edward Brown. Okay. He taught he had no legs, but his legacy and his legs to see was the legs of worship and praise. Those are two pillars of standing. Mm, I believe that. He was a, listen, he did, he does not get the credit for this, but he was the founder with, with and, I, and I know Timothy Harper, you know, he was one of the psalmists there, and Reggie called all these brothers back in those days, the Earl and all of them, Earl Battle, the worship. But we used to worship for hours. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even preach. Well, I don't know if you he saw last. I don't. I don't know if you saw last night's show. But I said I met him when I was there. Bishop Jackie McCullough was there preaching. I met him there. I was there with some some bishop friends at the time. I was up. You know, they were trying to ordain me a bishop, but God told me clearly, said, do not do that. That's not your direction. I still got the paperwork just in case they want to be shamed to my, they weren't going to ordain me a bishop. Yes, you was, because you know, I set up churches all around the world. You want me to be, be the bishop church planting, but I ain't do it. Right, right. But anyway, but I'm going to say this, and I said on that show, I said, when I met him, I said, I felt prayer from him. So you just confirmed that for me. I'm going to have to let you go, because one minute, thank you for calling. He did. Yes, all right. What's your name? Where you calling from? You have one minute. Call it in in the 9874. Hey, Larry. This is Marcellus calling from Beverly Hills really quick. Um, there is so many things that I, I could say about this particular program. But before I get into the question that I have, because there are a couple of inconsistencies that I want to highlight, and I think that we need to give some credence to. Well, before I, I highlight that, let me just tell Bernard Jordan, uh, thank you for saying that she's a woman of God and all that. That's real nice of you, but we need you to write a check. Um, that's real wonderful, um, and that's nice of you all to be saying she's a great woman of God. But we need for all of you all that claim that you loved him so much to get uh, your checkbooks out and make those checks payable to her um, and make sure that she gets put into a place where she can live. There's a couple things here as a financial planner that I'm a little disturbed by. And I have quite uh, a few questions. Now, I sit on the board of several different churches, and I understand quite well how the, the 501c3 compensation packages for preachers and bishops work. And based on some of her statements, some of the things that she said could not actually be the way that she's actually stating them. Mm -hmm. Now, the first, thing that I, the first thing that I want to highlight is the fact that she says that he did not have a bank account until he got sick. Mm -hmm. um, that that could not be legally true um, because in the same sense, in the same statement that she made, she said that uh, all he got was when he got sick, he got a little stipend from the church and then his social security check, but he had, didn't own a bank account. That cannot be the case because legally uh, with the IRS and the way that the compensation packages, and Larry, you know this, you was a pastor, uh, the way that things have been set up, he cannot legally, uh, you know, take from the church and not be able to document those things and have a, a paper trail as to where that money went. Um, that that is completely inconsistent. But Marcellus, uh, so let, let me let me say, let me say this: what I found out from some of my pastor friends um, years ago. They get them 501c3 compliances and they do that just so they can do for them um, to get stuff without taxes and just so they can tell the people they can file their taxes to get more money. Most their stuff don't be handled right. And most pastors buy their cars, buy their houses and everything in ministry names and they don't get no money in their name. If it's in their name and direct deposit, even their tax money, it goes into the church account. So and number one, she says she well, don't know, and I believe she don't know. I can tell, but what she did, she okay. don't know. And probably these people were not handling things right. 
Well, it obvious that's obvious. Well, the <laughs> statement that she made was well, the statement that she made was that he did not have a bank account, but then she turned around and said he was getting a social security check. Yeah, that and my question is, yeah. yeah, where was the social security check going? That just sent up a little red flag for me. Gotcha. That's just on the personal note. Um, right. You know, because that's an inconsistency to the statement. Now, she also said that she had been a part of the church for five years before her and the bishop, uh, you know, got into their relationship. But uh, be that as it may, and she claimed that there was a whole bunch of mess with his other wives and the other people got into the relationship with those other wives. Well, just based on the statements that she made, he was in the church when he was involved with those other wives. So was she not aware of the stuff that was going on with the other wives? Because, you know, you can't be in church and one day your pastor's married and the next week he's not married no more. And then he's chasing after you, telling you that God told you you're supposed to be mm. his wife. That just seems to know. be a little in that, but that's an inconsistency. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying, Larry. I'm Got just giving you an inconsistency. Gotcha. And I know you, I, all of all and I know if you're a financial planner, you're very analytical, and I know that you caught that. Thank you so much for calling in. I gotta go. Next call. Oh. Okay, caller ending in eleven oh eleven oh six. What's your name? Where you calling from? You got one minute for real. I'm gonna hit the X. <laughs> yes, I'm Prophet Starling Gray, and I want it to be clear that I am a member and serve under Archbishop E. Bernard Jordan. And I was squirming because I kept in messaging <laughs> saying that my Archbishop did give her money. Yeah. I stated that on your blog yesterday. Yeah. He did give her money, and she returned it because Archbishop Roy E. Brown made a pledge that she wanted to honor. Also, she, when you first asked her the question several times, she did not say no. She said there is protocol. And what she was trying to uh, allude to is that she wasn't going to throw my archbishop under the bus and cause friction with the other bishops. Mm -hmm. The truth is my archbishop and not only my archbishop, but my pastor, Lady Deborah Jordan, have been giving her money privately. Mm. Okay. Also, gotcha. Bishop Shema Womack have been assisting her Thank privately you. and trying to, but with the, the decision to separate shows that there are people who are not yes. in agreement yes. with doing the right thing. Yes. And that is why my Archbishop, who I honor and respect, yes. made the decision to separate because he will not be a part yes. of anything where women are abused. Hold don't right there. Don't, don't you hang up. Don't you hang up. Don't you, don't you touch that down. But see, this is what I'm saying. This is why we have to have these kind of shows. Because this stuff was put out there, so we need to know. So you brought information. And, I'm and, the, and I received your blog in my inbox by the niece who mm -hmm. I have been, who I spoke to, who called me from London. Mm -hmm. And I am the one that pushed her to blow this up and put it public because sometimes you have to embarrass the devil to, into doing the right mm -hmm. thing. And so I am the reason why all of this is public because I pushed the niece to do so. And God used you. Absolutely. This proves but to I me. Am not, I'm not appreciating the side comments about my bishop because he is honorable. Now, whether you believe or support his ministry, that's on you. That, yeah, that's yeah. no skin off my chin yeah. or you or his because mm -hmm. we are blessed and he, I know him to be a man of honor and integrity. If you don't understand the prophetic, then, you know, first I would invite you to the midnight cry because we have <laughs> prophetic prayer every night and I leave that under um, our um, leading lady, Pastor Deborah Jordan, it's her prayer ministry, and I assist her every night. So I want to invite you to that, each of you. Join me in prayer every night, midnight, Eastern Standard Time, 515-604-9266, and let's pray about this thing yeah. and bring it to, to light and, and let God uncover it. Because God showed me there, are, there were thieves that mm. were trying to steal from her. It's not just the house. There are other mm. things that should be coming into her hands. Mm. That needs to be uncovered. Wait a minute. Don't you turn this into a prophetic show now. But look, th this is what I want to say. I don't know Bishop Bernard Jordan except for a few Snapchats back and forth and stuff doing that whole Brian Corn thing. But this is what I know. This is what this is what I know. I come from a line of prophets. 
I don't have to agree or nobody has to agree with everything that he said or teach for whatever reason. But you can tell a person's spirit. You can't fake that. And I just knew when they told me that he pulled out, it made it just made everything make sense. And and then talking to this lady, when I saw the video clip of her, I I could feel her spirit or energy, however you want to want to look at it. And I knew she is an honorable woman. This is clear. She is extremely humble. It's clear. And yes, and and to speak to the brother who just got off the phone. Okay, you're intelligent and you know all these things, but you have to understand, Bish, Archbishop Roy Brown was over 20 years her senior. She was naive. Okay, and sometimes when you know you could be blind in the house, you could be lost in the house, you could be ignorant and saved and love the Lord. You know, you could be you know heavenly minded and no earthly good. We know those kind of people. Mm -hmm. She was sweetly saved. She is sweetly saved. Loves God and she was she is being exploited and taken advantage of because she did not want to rebel against him and say no i need to know what's going on you know she mm -hmm. could have you know rolled her neck like a lot of us black yeah. women would do yeah she could have snapped crackled and popped in the name of jesus yeah amen <laughs> thank okay. you so but thank you so much was on, honoring roy brown she honored her they attended our, our convocations they attended the, our last, not this last prophetology because he expired um, in June, but um, the last in February, he was at that prophetology and the one before that. So he was a support of Archbishop. He consecrated my bishop as Archbishop in mm. 2016. Yeah, I remember that. Thank you so much for calling okay. in. But I had to let you go a little over because you were saying some, you were talking that stuff. I let it kind of going on. Thank you so much for calling. Don't in. come from my bishop. Oh, don't I ain't come from my bishop. But are you talking Not to the? You. I, oh. I'm, 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 I'm let. And 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 for the and let me say just one more thing. And for this individual that pointed posted a video about my bishop's rent party, that was a lie. That was wow. his ascension banquet, his ascension uh, consecration, and it was a six hundred dollar registration fee. Yes, in the same year he sold one of the houses because we lost our tax exempt status and he did not want to continue to put that burden on the church. Thank you very much. Thank you. This as, let, Before you open up the line, somebody else, y'all listen to me and I said this a long time ago, the church is going to have to get used to living in this information age. Shows like mine, all you preachers and celebrity artists, you know, I got a call from Hollywood, we're about to have somebody real big that I'm going to be able to interview in the studio here. This, the court of public opinion is higher than the courts in the land. And when it comes to these rumors and stuff people say, you need to have somebody in your ministry that will speak in social media that can be respectable and smart because this is going to have to happen. It's, you're going to have to give answer. You can come up here and deny everything. That's fine. It, it's an answer. You can say it ain't happened. That's an answer. But you can't say nothing. And I am so glad to hear that there have been people helping her. And I'm, and this shows you this, this lady's kind of character. She didn't want to tell that like that because of a protocol. Shoot, she, I, we didn't. Next prayer revival, something I do. When I get some time or something, she need to come in and say, this, what, this, this woman is made out of something golden. All right, next caller. One minute now. I ain't playing with y'all. I'm going to hit the X. <laughs> caller in and 0093. What's your name? Where you calling from? You got one minute. Talk fast. Hey, Ronnie. This is Vanessa from Texas. I just want to chime in. Um, I think that if you are a true believer of God or a true person that is connected to God's 90 spirit, seconds connecting, then you can read right through the purity of the caller, the Miss Paula. You can read through the purity of those that have benefited for her, or like the lady that was just on the phone saying, you know, backing up what she's doing or, or the other prophet or however. But she came out of a condition of what she said, and it really appalled me to watch the comments how if you are commenting from a place of and again, you can say whatever you want to say, but if you're commenting from a place of she's lying or she's this, or 60 something seconds of what she's saying, I am sorry, but I came to set the record straight. You don't know the God. You don't know the creator, and you don't know the one who created you, and you agreed to come into this earth. And I say that for a family because 
your spirit will tell you when somebody is able or not in the right light or, or coming from a ill will place. Yeah. And that woman bared her soul. Yeah. I have been a person who I work out of unconditional, as I've said on many times as I call. And I took care of my husband when he got into a car accident and didn't look for a diamond. When he got his $100,000, I didn't have $2 to show. So I literally come from a place of unconditional mm. love. And there is, excuse my French, you don't curse, but there is a freaking difference. And so when you come from unconditional, you're not looking for the next dollar. You're not looking for these things. Gotcha. And y'all are saying that she's Ten naive. Ten seconds. She's not naive. I didn't ask about the previous wives or the previous girlfriends because I came about my assignment, and those things would have been distractions. So gotcha. I'm done. But gotcha. please go through your discernment and really tap into the true God and not this Jesus you've been fed. Gotcha. I adore you. Thank you so much. That was two minutes, though. There were two darn minutes. There were two minutes. I done told y'all. Well, she had to wait that turn. Darn. Hit the thing. All right. You got one minute. Call the 3466. What's your name? Where you calling from? Hi. I'm calling from Texas. And I just wanted to thank you, Larry, for giving Miss um, Paula a voice. I can tell by how long-winded she was, how much she talked, because she used to people not letting her talk. Yeah. And I appreciate you for allowing her to simply say what was on her mind. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Continue to watch the show. Call her in at an 8555. Five. What's your name? Where are you calling from? You have one minute. D. Scott calling from Ohio, uh, Columbus by way of Bowling Green. The time is coming, the Bible says, and now is the judgment shall begin at the house of God. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, what shall the end of the ungodly be? We have coming to uh, the reality that church, the institution of church is as it was in the days of Jesus, that, you know, that he was talking about how well we look on the outside, but inside we're full of dead men's bones. The institution of church is antithetical to the will and the disposition of Christ. The institution of church, in my opinion, is going to have to die so that mm. the body of Christ can live. And I'm a former pastor as well. And I left the church because I found out that the people I was leading never wanted to leave the mental constraints of the paradigm, the institution of church, to actually become the body. Bless you, man, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much. You hear what he said? That's what I said in this book, Let the Church Say Change, forwarded by Dr. Mark Sharona, as seen on the Word Network, Impact, and all the... No, I didn't do this book. I done, I done, I done this other book, the... The five four ministers reference book up there. Y'all can get all that on Barnes and Nobles. All right, let's go. Now who is that calling me? You know I'm on live. Caller in and then five five zero seven two. What's your name and where you're calling from? You got one minute. This is your auntie Marlene. You got first ladies all over the world waking up their husbands right now, asking them <laughs> can they see that paperwork. Okay. Okay. They <laughs> but I am praying for her, and I have been a fool for love, but she is a saint. Yeah. She is a saint of God, and I am actually going to do the go fund and intercede for Lady Paula. God thank, bless you, man. Thank you so much. Everybody, please hit that go fund me. It is pinned up on the Facebook doc, uh, on the Facebook.com backslash Larry Reed Live, the live video that is on right now. Please hit the go fund me. All right, next caller. Call her in and then 62, 67. What's your name? Where you calling from? You have one minute. I in Brooklyn, New York. I just wanted to say that I believe that this crisis that has occurred uh, to Lady Paula is prophetic. Um, God has been dealing with me the past uh, couple of weeks uh, about the end of the age that we're coming to. And uh, 2018 marks the end of an age and antichrist are popping out of the woodwork um from what i have been observing and not only that um the the church is is half children of the devil and half children of god Ooh. and god is cleaning the church out Ooh. uh he is removing the tears it's all biblical you can uh, go to my facebook page i have it i have a couple videos explaining it he's removing the tears all i can tell you the warning message i say to you now is for anybody who is in the 
church right now, and if you know in your heart of hearts that you don't believe in Jesus Christ and you don't belong there, I don't care if you're a pastor, I don't care if you're a bishop, I don't care if you're in the choir, I don't care if you are, uh, you, you've been giving them money for many, many years, lots of thousands of thousands, leave now, because judgment is coming to the church, and when the fire of God hits the church, you better be able to withstand that fire, and you've got to be righteous in order to withstand that fire. Thank you so much for calling. All right. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Caller in and in 2704, what's your name and where you're calling from? You have one minute. Hello. Hello. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, man, this is Jesse Free, man. I was just basically calling to say a lot of people say that this woman is naive, but... I don't believe she's naive. I believe that she was just basically trying to please God in what she was doing. Okay. Um, and I also believe that, uh, you know, what you said about the information age and that technology, I believe that uh, a lot of people, man, the church is really going to have to understand that <clears throat> there are eyes everywhere now. People have cell phones. You got the computer information is traveling at the speed of a light. So, it's really time to just do the right thing if you're in leadership. It's time to live right. It's time to do right. It's time to treat people right. It's just time to do the right thing because you will be exposed because okay. there are eyes and ears everywhere. So I'm just going to pray for her, man, and hope that God blesses her, man, with another man. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm available. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I you, can be you better shoot your shot. <laughs> if that should be the case. My name is Jesse Freeman. I'm just a normal brother, but I definitely have a job and I work hard. Come on. And uh, I know how to be the woman. Now, you don't have to be my maid. <clears throat> you can just be my companion. Come on. We can build together whatever the <laughs> Lord will command. Thank you so God much. For... <laughs> Thank you so much for calling in. That was funny. All right. I want all pastors to make sure you get this book. Let the church say change as opposed to amen. I don't care what Marvin Wine is talking about. Let the church say amen. Uh-uh. Let the church say change. Forwarded by Dr. Mark Sharona. It's on barnesandnobles.com. Go get it right now. What is it? What? I'm going to go. She's not coming up on the keyboard. We'll get to her. But this is the thing. Okay, tell her to call one eight four four Doctor Reed two. It'll come to my phone, and I'll just do it that way and patch her in. All right, next caller. In the meantime, I can't just put somebody up to the top like that. It's, it's, it's not that. It's not that she wanted to. I get that, but you have to wait in your darn line because all these folk up here they got to talk too. All right, caller. I don't know if you can hear me. It's you because your number coming up looking all kind of strange. What's your name? Where you're calling from? One minute. Caller? Shoot. You knocked them off? No. She must have hung And was waiting all that she long time. I didn't do nothing. Okay. Caller in in the 7775. Name where you're calling from. You got one minute. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. You got it. Hello? He, he dropped two? Yeah. Okay, next one. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Caller in and in five seven six three. What's your name and where you calling from? Pastor Mitchell calling from New Jersey. Uh, I got a question. I, I looked at the, 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 the notice that was placed on Hold Facebook. Hold a minute. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, I was looking at the notice that was placed on Facebook. That doesn't seem to be a court-ordered notice. It seems like it's from a lawyer. She doesn't have to get out of that house, does she? Whoa. I Until don't know. Court. No, I was in school for she law for one semester and left and went and do what Jesus then wanted me to do and finish my degree in, theo <laughs> the in theology and education and, 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 and Christian counseling and stuff. I don't know. So if somebody watching that know, let us know. Yeah, that, that's just a notice from a lawyer. That that hasn't been brought before a judge. In fact, uh, I don't know what the laws is 
in New York, but you can't evict somebody in 10 days. That you, First of all, you have to go to court to evict, to evict somebody. Mm, okay. All right. We hear that. Thank you so much for calling. All right. To, to, is this Tawana? Okay, I'm going to put you on speakerphone, and there may be a little bit of delay. I don't know why you couldn't get through, but we're going to let you talk. Here we go. Okay. All right, state your name, where you're calling from, and say what you want to say. My name is Tawana E. Brown. I am the daughter of Archbishop Roy Brown, and I'm calling from Brooklyn. I mean, Queens. All right, go ahead on. So, um, I wanted to just say this for a few minutes. Um... There are a lot of things that are not being told that are that I don't know why. Um, I I'm a very transparent person. I have no reason to lie about my dad. My father took very good care of his wife. Um, they were married for 22, 23 years. Um, he gave her eight hundred dollars a week for twenty two years. The church gave him twelve hundred dollars a week, and out of that twelve hundred. He gave her $800 a week for 22 years. That was how he provided for her. The church, the house was in the church name after he divorced his second wife for tax purposes. He had to put the, uh, the house in the church name because the IRS was coming after him. This was way before he married her. So that's why the house was not given to her because he had to turn it over into, um, put it into the church's name. At the time of them being married, he kept asking the church to sell the house to buy them a condo. Um, so there were a lot of things that are not being said. Why the church is not saying these things to defend my father, I don't know. I have no clue. I can care less about a lawyer. The truth needs to be told. Um, my father took very well care of her. And yes, Prophet Jordan always gave my father a lot of money. And every time he gave my father money, it was given to his wife. At times when my father uh, was sick, he would ask her for his money. She told him, you cannot have your money. I will take, you can take me to court if you want your money. There was a lot of abuse going on in the home, okay? So there are a lot of things that will not be said because people don't want to look bad. I called adults on her. One of her nieces named Teresa put it up on her Facebook page. So uh, calling Adult Protective Services, she took me to court and would not allow me to see my father two years and told my father that if I came back to the house, she was going to buy a gun and kill me. My father begged me not to come because he said, I can't protect you. I have no name. She's going crazy. So there are a lot of things that were going on that no one said, but I'm not going to sit back now and allow things to be said about my father that were not true because he could not defend himself and he did not have access to his own money. Yes, there was a checking account at Chase Bank with her name on the account. They just sent me a letter from the, the court because she had to fill out a paperwork in order to go get the rest of the money out, but she had to put down that he had a child, and they had to let me know what she was doing. I have all the papers. So th these are a lot of lies that are going on that need to stop. You want to give her money? Go ahead. But the Bible talks about swindling God's people, and this is what's going on right now. So you all add $800 a week for 22 years and see how much money that is to a wife that stayed home to take care of her husband and didn't have any bills because the church put every iota bill. Every bill. They were even paying her car note for a while until they discussed it with my father and it was too much for them to continue to pay every bill plus her car note. It was too much and her car insurance. So there are a lot of stuff that's not being told, but I don't have a problem in telling you. Let me Nobody can do anything. Let me ask, let me ask you a question. Are you are you still an active part of the church? No, I am not. They did some things to me that I don't agree with, and I'm not gonna dog them out. But there were some things that were done to me that was not right either. But it doesn't matter. Two wrongs don't make a right, and I'm not gonna allow, um, you know, things to be not said. You understand what I'm saying? And right. Just on this, I would like to say her niece came on yesterday and said she didn't have a lawyer. Well, that's a lie. They called her in to one of my friends, one of my father's friends' churches, to discuss with her about when she could leave the house. When she got there, they thought it was going to be on a, you know, friendly basis, at a, you know, a, a peaceful place. 
and she came lawyered up. They did. They were not prepared, and they did not have a lawyer. So this is how that paperwork got out there. This is how that happened. This is the beginning of it. She came lawyered up, and they were not prepared. Yes, I feel that they did things wrong. They should have rescheduled with her, and then, you know, had yeah. the proper meeting. But they didn't do that. Okay, they didn't do that, and people react. That's what happened. When you, in your emotions, you react. So they reacted wrongly. Yes, they did. They reacted wrongly. Agree. But two wrongs don't make a right. Well, and this. Uh, that's how the paperwork got out. There. Okay, I'm gonna say this now. To me, it doesn't seem as though. I mean, I. It doesn't seem to me that she's trying to bad mouth Bishop Brown. I think my opinion and some of the opinions of other people from the outside looking in and please know that we don't know everything it looked as though that your father dropped the ball in making provisions that weren't was straight from him to her and not through the church and also you you said in your video that you didn't receive anything why why is that hello can you hear me Video, I didn't receive it. Yeah, but I'm not calling about me. I'm not, you know, I, nothing on you. I'm not calling about me. I'm a grown woman. I will take care of myself. Okay. That's not it. I have an excellent job. Gotcha. An excellent job. I will take care of myself. You understand what I'm saying? I just felt what my father told me. He, Say it again. You cut out. Someone else knows that he left me too. I said, it's just that I, I, I said that on my video. Just to let people know that people are, are wanting and raging and being angry. And if I'm the daughter that's not angry, what rights do you all have to be angry? That's why I said that on my video. Not to make Pilgrim look bad. Because right. regardless of what I don't agree with and what I want done right, that's still my foundation. Right. I got you. Now, that's true. Now, that is true. That's still my foundation. Right. Regardless. And even if you all are saying she's not trying to make my father look bad, you're not trying to make my father look bad by opening your mouth, but by making it seem as though he didn't leave her a house, he didn't provide properly. Provisions are made differently. Giving somebody $800 a week for 22 years is providing. She said that that was an allowance to do the things that he wanted to do that the church didn't pray for, that the church didn't pay for, like going out to eat and other stuff like that. She said that 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 was a, a, the allowance that he gave her so that it can be used when they would go other places and da 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 that stuff that the church didn't pay for. Oh, they did everything. Where, where did they go? The church paid for everything. Wherever they went, the church paid for everything. Wherever they traveled to, the church paid for everything. Oh, that's a lie. Okay. The church paid for everything. That was just her allowance. That's what I'm saying to you. Gotcha. That was her allowance. And all I'm saying is my father retired. Anybody with common sense know most preachers do not prepare properly. Especially for preachers like they call my father OG. They yeah. don't prepare properly. Yeah, he's an OG. They, they but but can, is, is it okay for us to have an opinion that we still don't think, even with the allowance, there's still nothing that he put in place for her to have at least a house after 22 years. So in my opinion, that that ain't proper. Are you okay with somebody having that opinion okay. without them feeling like they're... Yeah, they have, right. I, I'm okay with them having an opinion, period. Okay. Because opinion is proper. You can have one. I have a show, and it's, you can have an opinion. I have my opinion on what right. I say. But what I'm trying to say is my father provided, maybe he didn't provide properly. Okay. We can say that. Right. All right. All right. But True. He did the best he could with her. Out of all three of his marriages, he tried to do the best with this one. I agree. From what I read and what I saw, I agree. He wasn't a perfect man. He wasn't a perfect man. I agree with that. And he was a great man, actually. I think he was a great, a great, wonderful man. But you can be great, wonderful, and still get it wrong. And and in and, and one area. And he did. And he did. He did. In that area, he did not uh, properly do what he may have, should have done. But even if he didn't, you were still taking care of to where you are able to buy your own right now. And you can get out of that house and stop this drama. Gotcha. There's no need for all of this. Now, I'm it's a, unnecessary. I'm going to ask you one thing before I let you go. Why weren't you, and you don't have to answer, why weren't you left anything as his only daughter? I was left money, and he told me I could have any chandelier in the house that I want because they're worth a lot of money, okay? My father felt bad, I guess, because he put so much into the church mm -hmm. by other buildings, um, doing all that. And let you all know, Pilgrim does not have money.
money like that because my father took every dime that the church gave him and he put it into the church. My father was a church man. That's who he was. Wrong, right or wrong, however you all may feel about it. Got it. He poured everything into the church. That's most pa most people that are establishmentarians. Uh -huh. That's the, what they do. That's what I did for 20 years. I have one last question for I you. Think. Has Deborah written you a check as his only daughter? Has she given you any money? No. no. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for calling in and sharing your story. You don't have to share. Thank you for the vulnerability, for the openness. God bless you. And I pray that you're able to grieve your father's death and that you will, you will not get stuck in the grief, but you'll come through it. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye -bye. Lord Jesus, Nam. Well, we have, we've heard enough. We just need to hear from Deborah now. We've heard enough to make our decisions. I still believe that we should, clearly Bishop didn't do all of what he needed to do for her. One of his spiritual sons, E. Bernard Jordan and Deborah Jordan, they agree with that. So they're doing some things. They have disconnected themselves. I hope William Hudson will do something from the assembly. You need to. So you don't end up on this show. <laughs> Ow! Okay. All right. Well, you're going to see me live one more time this week outside of Monday at 7 p.m. Because I have an interview to do with somebody from Hollywood. If they solidify that. And I also have to talk to you about the Omarosa. And next week. Tuesday and Wednesday, Greenleaf premiere. We're going to be live right after the premiere of Greenleaf, and we're going to be talking about what's going on on that show and connecting it. Heck, we just had Greenleaf tonight. And connecting it to what is going on and have the conversation. It's going to be fun. You're going to be able to call in. We're going to do it just for a little while because it's late. On the wild and we're open, open them. Got that show coming on so darn late. And they know we got to go to work the next day. All right. I want you to support Keon D. Henderson's new single, Holy, and Sylvia Harris' new single, No Ground. Both of these are some terrible singers. They're indie artists, and they're doing great, and they are bombarding the gospel billboard airplay charts right now. I'm going to put the link up under there on Facebook, stream or download, whichever you do, both of those songs. All right, until next time, make sure you subscribe there on youtube.com backslash Larry Live and text Larry Live, no spaces to 33222 so you get notified next time we're on. Peace!